They tell you that hell is hot. A raging inferno filled with the screams of the damned and tormented. They were wrong. Hell is cold. A freezing black void of silence where the condemned spend an eternity far from the light of God. Only their wretched memories to keep them company. Even they begin to fade over time. How long had I been in this aching void? I, I had no idea. I still remembered my name, my family, and my friends. The faces of my victims, though, I tried hard not to think about that. In life, I had suffered from a deranged madness that had caused me to kill. It was only when I arrived in hell that my head cleared and sanity returned. I suppose madness was a kind of escape, not allowed for me here. More time passed. A day, perhaps a year, a hundred, a thousand. When a light suddenly appeared in the darkness and an angel stood before me, an angel with black wings. A golden band, almost crown-like, circled its head. I realized I was looking at a halo. I couldn't really make out the sex. The creature looked beautifully female, terrifyingly masculine all at the same time. The only thing I did know was that I was in the presence of evil. An evil that made my shriveled soul shudder. Christian Davis, the thing said, looking at ancient parchment. Get to your feet. I was just about to answer that I had no feet when I realized I was suddenly clothed in flesh again. Hurry up, slave, the creature growled. You have an audience with the king of hell. All of a sudden, an eternity alone seemed like a blessing. Lucifer, I croaked, no longer used to speech. The fallen one did not answer, but turned his back to me and slammed his midnight wings together, illuminating what I now saw was a small cell with slime-covered walls. Follow, he commanded, leading the way. I did as I was bid, stepping out of my cell and entering a vast hallway where rearing black pillars reached up into a starless sky and strange creatures swooped and called to each other shrilly. It seemed like we walked for an eternity through an ever-changing landscape of horrors. In one place, fire burned and the smell of sulfur hung heavily in the air. In another place, the ground was covered in an orgy of naked bodies. The air stank of sex and blood, and I realized to my horror that these lustful bodies were not individuals, but one writhing mass fused together forever by their own terrible desire. What is this place? I finally worked up the courage to ask the fallen one who stopped and surveyed the scene, reaching out a hand to stroke a nearby thrusting buttocks. It's hell, of course, he laughed. In my father's house. There are many rooms. Come, he said, moving off. It's not wise to keep Lucifer waiting. He is not known for his patience, and his wrath is a terrible thing to behold. Sometime later, we stood before a black castle. The terrain was black and arid with skeletal trees from which hung rotting corpses that screamed and cried out as ravens tore at their flesh. In there, the black-winged angel said, pointing towards a huge archway that was emblazoned with a glowing rune. My master awaits you inside. You're not coming with me? I pleaded, terrified at the thought of being alone in this place. Not me, he said, looking at the castle thoughtfully. I stay away from that one as much as possible. His mood has been dour as of late, and I would like to keep my head a little while longer. Now go. I would tell you to pray, but God hears no words uttered in this place. That said, he quickly turned away and left, leaving me alone. For a moment, I was tempted to run, but where to? Where did one hide from the king of hell? Taking a deep breath, I pushed at the massive wooden doors that swung open easily, as if expecting me. Inside was a great hall with a high vaulted ceiling. 
There were no windows, only black obsidian walls, and yet I could see quite clearly. And I realized the illumination was coming from the end of the hall. As I approached, it grew brighter and brighter, pulsating around my body with a terrible cold heat and like I could stand it no longer and I fell to my knees, crying out half-blinded, and yet I was drawn onward like a moth to some terrible flame. And then, just like that, it was gone, and a golden throne shone before me. Sat upon it was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. A terrible beauty that you would die for, kill for, give up your very soul to possess. The creature smiled at me, as if reading my thoughts, then stood up, dependent in its golden armor, its black wings unfurling as it looked down at me with piercing blue eyes. Stand up, it said, but I could not. I, oh, I could only stare, taking in the, the, the splendor of the creature before me. With a sigh, it stepped back, bathing itself in a glowing white light until only an ordinary-looking man stood before me in an immaculate tailored suit and tie. Is that better? He asked. Yes, I answered, slowly climbing to my feet. <laughs> you mortals, he laughed. Such simple creatures, so easy to bedazzle, so easy to manipulate. Whatever was my father thinking when he created you? I wonder if he regrets it. Come, he said, leading me over to a nearby table that was laden with all manner of food and smoking joints. I realized I was hungry, ravenous. With a cry, I leapt to the table and started stuffing food into my mouth, tearing at smoking flesh, cramming strange and exotic foods into my mouth until my stomach started to ache and groan. I tried to stop, but I realized I could not. My will was no longer my own. I, I was choking now, gagging on rich food. I staggered away, falling to my knees, and was violently sick, heaving smoking chunks of flesh onto the floor. Through all this, Lucifer sat at the table laughing, uproariously. <laughs> tut tut, he mocked. Don't you know that gluttony is a sin? <laughs> what will you do next? I gasped, suddenly furious. Pull the wings from flies? His smile faltered then and he caressed his own wings lovingly. No, I would never pull the wings from anything. My own were torn from me on the day I was cast down. It took me an eternity to grow them back. And when they did, they were black. The ultimate jest from an unforgiving god. God, I spat. What's he ever done for me? In life, I was an insane, crazed killer, and in death, and death, he left me here to rot. Indeed, he said, leaning closer. It was that seething hatred that drew me to you. Uh, it put you on my radar, you might say. What do you want from me? I said, staggering to my feet. A good question, he said, playing with a golden goblet from which he drank. Very good question, indeed. Uh, tell me, uh, Mr. Davis... How would you like to get out of here? Uh, a small vacation, if you will. After the job is done, I'm sure that you could be made to feel more comfortable in your damnation. What job? I asked, falling into a nearby chair. Suddenly he was on his feet, sweeping the chair from under me, causing me to spill to the floor. On your knees, he screeched. On your knees before me. I looked up into his blazing face and I saw a madness there that could melt mountains and dry up entire oceans, and I realized he was insane, driven mad by his own damnation. Forgive me, Lord, I groveled, laying on my belly like a worm, trying desperately to kiss his feet. You disgust me, he said, kicking my reaching hands away. Your kind has always disgusted me. He seemed somewhat calmer now and smiled down at me almost pityingly. Now you may sit, he said, gesturing to the fallen chair, which I quickly righted and fell into, keeping a wary eye on him. But he only smiled and poured an oily substance that smelled like wine into a goblet before thrusting it into my hand. There's been an escape, uh, a breakout, 
if you will. Now, I don't know how it happened, but it has. Five souls have escaped the pit, and I want them back. No one escapes this place. No one defies me. Do you understand? Yeah, yes, master, I said quickly. He seemed to enjoy my turn of phrase and settled more comfortably into his chair before going on. Are these five, much like you, killers and degenerates, that's why I chose you. Your minds are somewhat similar. This will help you in the hunt. I mean, of course, other help will be provided, but first, I have an errand for you. A small test, if you will. He smiled, and the light of madness burned in his eyes. Now, go. He clicked his fingers, and once again I was cast into darkness. For a moment I feared I had been transported back to my cell, but then... Then I felt the cold dirt on my face, and sat up, taking a large, gasping breath. I let out a, a bellow of pain as I was reborn into the world. I was in a forest. Naked. And alone. Sitting in a shallow grave. I, I was suddenly aware of a searing pain in my throat and reached out, feeling the gaping wound there that even now had started to knit and close under my probing fingers. I tried to stand but sank back down to my knees, noticing that my pale skin was covered in streaks of blood. What is this? I mumbled. Where am I? You are in the body of a dead man. Or at least he was. A voice whispered in a sylvan hiss from above my head. Quickly I looked up. A large black snake looked down at me from flat reptilian eyes. Well? It hissed, revealing needle-like fangs. Hadn't you better be about the master's business? What business? I asked, staggering to my feet, twisting at the bindings that bound my bloody wrists. The man you seek is inside, it said, slithering further up a twisting branch. I followed its movements, noticing a bright light off in the distance. There are two men. One you must kill. The other will assist you once he has ascended the throne. I, I don't understand, I said, climbing out of my own grave where I stood, shaking in the frigid night air. What's to understand? The serpent hissed. Our master wants this oathbreaker dead, and you will be his instrument in this. Is he one of the five? One of those who escaped? No, the snake replied. This is a mere errand and a trial, if you will. Now go. I grow tired of your endless questions, and I'm feeling the urge to bite something. Quickly, I scrambled away and headed towards the light, casting off my bindings as I went. After what seemed like endless walking through the night-shrouded forest, I stumbled upon a gravel driveway that led to a ranch-style-looking mansion. Wincing at the pain in my feet, I stared up at it, noticing that every light in the house seemed to burn, and yet that the night was deafeningly quiet. I approached the door and wondered if I should knock when it creaked open, as if by its own volition. The hallway was vast and carpeted, a deep crimson with a high decorative ceiling. A crystal chandelier twinkled, lending the place an almost ethereal quality. I was hearing something, a low humming coming from a nearby a nearby staircase. As I drew closer, I realized it was the voice of many people chanting from below a low-cut door embedded in the staircase itself. Taking a deep breath, unsure of what I would find within, I gently opened the door, revealing a set of rough, hewn stair steps leading down into a flickering gloom. As I ascended, the chanting grew louder, seeming to echo all around me. At the bottom of the stairs, I turned a tight corner, and I was greeted by the sight of a vast cavern, filled with glowing black candles. The room was overflowing with people in hooded black robes, all but one stood by what looked like an ancient altar, red-robed, knife poised to strike at the bound naked girl writhing upon the stone. Behind him hung a great black cross. Inverted, a glowing pentagram carved into the middle, depicting the face of some horned beast. 
To the sight of me, the man dropped the knife and began to shake violently, attracting the attention of the other men in the room. That this cannot be, he gasped. You're dead. I, I killed you myself. I was just about to answer him when my mouth dropped open and Lucifer's voice issued forth. David, 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 I thought we had a deal. Is, is that you, master? The man replied, falling to his knees. The others seeing this did the same, pushing their foreheads into the dust. You know damn well who this is, the voice hissed from between my lips. We had an agreement, David. Once a month, when the moon was at its fullest, you would sacrifice two virgins unto me, a son of Adam and a daughter of Eve. In return, I would give you power, make you the leader of this coven. A and more has been done, great lord, the man whimpered. You lie, the voice screamed. This one was no virgin. Th that's impossible. He was one of the coven. He would, he would never lie to me. The voice laughed then. You overestimate your power over these dogs. This one lied to you because he hated you and knew he would bring my wrath upon you for such an unworthy sacrifice. And he was correct. I can hardly blame him for this, the priest cried out, crawling on his knees towards me until his cold hand caressed my feet. <laughs> but you can, the voice laughed, causing my head to look down upon his prone form. Besides, I grow tired of your nightly devotions. You bore me. Please, master, the man begged, but the voice had left my lips and was now in my head. Kill the fool. Kill him, then tell Bartholomew. He is now the leader of this coven, and that, that he is to assist you in any way and by any means. Do this and earn your place as my emissary upon earth. And just like that, he was gone. Murder, of course, was not unknown to me. In my former life, I had been quite insane and a prolific killer, but that was that was before my rebirth. The desire had fled from me, but the knowledge had not. Besides, the groveling man before me was evil, a follower of Lucifer, but was I, was I not the same? I tried to tell myself that that wasn't true. That I had been pressed into the Dark One's service. I should not kill this man regardless of his crimes, but in the end... In the end, my fear won out. And with a cry, I brought the sole of my foot crashing down on the back of his exposed neck. Breaking his spine. Killing him instantly. Bartholomew, I said, trying to interject some authority into my voice. Come forth. A tall, slender man with graying beard separated himself from the crowd and approached me warily, his deep sunken eyes never leaving my face. I am Bartholomew, he said in rich tones and, and bowing low. How can I help you, master? Your master is gone, but he left you a message, I said, tapping my skull. He says you are now leader here, and master of this coven, and that you are to assist me. If the news pleased him, he did not show it. And how may I be of assistance? He said, drawing closer. I was suddenly aware of the many eyes watching us. Perhaps we can talk somewhere more private, I said, nodding towards the watching cultists. Of course. All your needs shall be met, and then... You will tell me everything. His request sounded very much like a demand, but I let it slide. All I wanted was a good warm meal and a hot shower after the depths of hell. That in itself would seem like a small slice of heaven. An hour later found me in a small study, sitting by a roaring fire, my belly full and wearing a brand new set of clothes. Bartholomew pacing impatiently around me. So, he said, stopping the endless pacing and turning to face me. So tell me why you're here. You're surely not Matthew, he sneered. Matthew, the boy whose flesh you inhabit. 
And how do you know I'm not Matthew? I didn't, he laughed. You just told me. My name is, was, Christian Davis. I was in hell for... But that was something I didn't know. What date is it? I asked. What year? Why does it matter? It matters because I want to fucking know because you've been commanded to obey me. He bridled at that. I believe the word you used was assist. But the date is October 16th, 2022. Forty years, I gasped. I was in that place for forty years? What place? He asked excitedly. You were in hell, weren't you? Did you see him? Did you did you meet the Dark Father? Yes, I replied. I met him. And you're truly blessed above all men. I myself hope to stand in his glorious presence someday. You may want to hope for something else. He is about as crazy as a shithouse rat. How dare you? He recoiled from me. If you were not the Dark Prince's chosen, I would tear out your tongue with hot pincers for your blasphemies. But I am his chosen, I shrugged. And for why I'm here, I'm looking for five prisoners. Escapees from hell. Five, you say? His face growing suddenly excited as he scurried behind the nearby desk and pulled out a large black file. This appeared on our doorstep about a week ago. We did not understand why or what it was, but now, now I think I know, he said, dropping the file in my lap. It was sent here to help you. I did not reply, but I snapped open the folder. Inside were pictures of three men and two women. All were blank except one that had a name and an address written across the back in flowing black script. Underneath the address, written in large capital letters, was one word. First. I turned the picture back over and took a long, hard look at the woman staring back at me. She was incredibly beautiful, with flowing black hair, skin the color of moonlight, emerald green eyes. I turned the picture back over, looking at her name and address. Anne Tomlinson. Forty-six... Kiln Close, Bar Harbor, Maine. It suddenly came to me that I had no idea where I was. Everyone I had met so far spoke with an American accent, but if I was in the good old USA, then whereabouts had my resurrection taken place? Where am I? asked Bartholomew, who was now leaned over the back of my chair, staring at the girl's picture intently. Massachusetts. He shot right back as if he'd been expecting the question. Cape Cod, to be precise. Okay, not too far away then, I mused. About a five or six hour drive. You can set out in the morning. I'll have a car ready and waiting for you. Come, I'll show you to your room. I was just about to stand when the fire suddenly flared in a great gout of flame, causing me to cry out in alarm before suddenly dying back down and quickly going out. In the glowing ashes, there was a wicked-looking dagger a long bone handle in which strange archaic runes had been carved. The dagger of fate, Bartholomew gasped. Pushing me aside, he fell on his knees and scooped the dagger up, but as soon as his skin made contact, the dagger glowed white hot. With a scream of pain, the high priest cast it back into the ashes, great tears in his eyes as he cradled his wounded hands. Guess it's not for you, I said as I dropped to my knees where I reached out a tentative finger and gave the dagger a quick prod. When it didn't react, I took a deep breath and scooped it up, wincing against the pain. But there was nothing. It only sat in my hand, feeling like... like a perfect fit against my palm. The dagger of fate. Bartholomew repeated, his pain almost forgotten in the wonder of the thing. Do you know what you hold in your hand? That dagger was once wielded by Lucifer. In heaven, it is said that the archangel Michael still bears the scars of its touch. I looked in wonder at his shining blade. Michael, I whispered, knowing this blade had tasted the blood of angels. 
God help us all. The trip from Cape Cod to Bar Harbor was uneventful. Bartholomew had provided me with my own vehicle, snow tires and all. In the glove compartment I found a 9mm Glock and two large rolls of 20s. I used some of the cash to fill up the gas tank and grab the odd stale sandwich along the way. It was just getting towards dusk when I pulled into the car park of the Ocean View Hotel. Bartholomew had already called ahead and booked me a room. I had no ID, of course, but he told me it wouldn't be a problem. Just tell the clerk my name was Johnson and pay in cash. It was all taken care of. After a quick dinner in the hotel restaurant, I left the hotel with my folder and sat on a nearby beach. The sun was just starting to set and the smell of snow lay heavy in the air. I opened the folder and looked at the picture of my intended victim. I wondered what such a beauty had done to buy herself a one-way ticket to hell. And what right, if any, I had to send her back there. From behind me came a scramble of claws, and I cried out as something heavy fell against my shoulder before landing in my lap. It, it was a rat, a, a huge rat. With a cry of fear, I leapt to my feet, sending the loathsome creature toppling into the sand where it scrambled to its feet before settling down on its haunches, looking at me with disdain. Thanks for that, it said, brushing sand from its fur. Lucifer, I gasped, sitting back down hard. Is that you? No, it's a Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Who do you think it is? What are you doing here? I said. Looking around, but the beach was deserted. I came to talk to you. It would seem you're having some misgivings about this little venture of ours. I said nothing, but slammed the folder shut guiltily. The rat smiled then, showing yellowing canines before scurrying a little closer. Shall I tell you about the beautiful Miss Tomlinson? She's a killer. A killer of both men and children. She uses her looks to wed wealthy men, then she poisons them and their children and takes the life insurance. All right, Black Widow, this one. She had wiped out two whole families before she met her end. Not that it mattered. The police had already started to zero in on her activities anyway. How did she die? I asked, interested now. A simple mugging gone wrong. She was shot to death, fitting end, some would say. But now she's back and up to her old ways. She's found herself another sugar daddy and works on getting herself reestablished in the world. But you are going to stop her and send her back to me. The suffering she endured in hell will seem like a child's party compared to the agonies she will suffer at her return. But how will I know it's her? At this, he looked genuinely surprised. Y you have her picture right there, he said, nodding towards the file. Y yes, but surely she won't look like that anymore. She'll be clothed in different flesh, am I right? No, no, he chuckled. She is as you see her in the photo. How? I asked, genuinely confused. Why is she not like me, encased in the body of another? He sighed, sounding genuinely bored. You're clothed in the flesh of this boy because you had no body to return to. After your execution, your remains were burned and scattered to the winds. Anne, however, was drawn back to her own body. All her spirit had to do was literally sit in her grave and her resurrection began. But how? How was she able to do these things? Again, he shrugged. I really have no idea. My best bet is that she had some help. Just like she was helped in her escape, someone in hell believes it's time for a change of management, and this escape was orchestrated to undermine me. But these things are of no regard to you. All you have to do is go to the address you were given, destroy her body, and release her soul back unto me. I would suggest you be about it. My patience is growing thin. Use the dagger. Give me back what's mine. And just like that, he was gone, leaving an incredibly surprised rodent in his wake who scampered off into the darkness. My original intention was to get a good night's sleep, then begin the stalking process in the morning. I knew all about stalking a victim. I had done it a lot in my former occupation. 
Fuck it, I whispered into the dark. Let's just get it done. Moments later, I was in my car and driving over to her address. Didn't take long to get there. Her house was only situated a few blocks from Ocean View, a nice, stately-looking manor house set back a little from the rest of the houses at the end of the street. The place screamed of money, and from what I had been told of our girl, it suited her profile perfectly. Parking the car across from the looming gate, I turned off the light and snuggled down on my seat. I was in for a long wait, new from previous experience. The wee hours of the morning were the best time to strike. I felt some of the old excitement returning, but crushed it. I was not that person anymore. This was business, not pleasure. She deserves everything she gets, I thought to myself. But this brought little comfort. You're all doomed. In the end, everybody pays. It was just a little after 2 a.m. when I made my move. Climbing out of the car, I took the hell-bound blade and stuffed it inside my jacket. Keeping it low, I headed across the street. The gates were large and high, but I managed to scramble over them with extraordinarily little effort before heading up the tree-lined driveway, keeping to the shadows, praying there was no security lights or alarms I could accidentally trigger. If there were, none sounded. I approached the front entrance, relieved that the house was still extremely quiet. The thing now was what to do next, knowing it to be a fruitless endeavor. I reached out and gently tried the front doorknob. Finding it locked, I moved on to the other side of the house, checking the windows as I went, finding them all locked and secure. Okay, I mumbled. Only one thing for it. Returning to the front of the house, I simply rang the doorbell and waited. The door was almost immediately opened by none other than Anne Tomlinson herself. If I had not recognized her from her photo, the black pulsing aura that surrounded her would have immediately given her away. She laughed, and then reached out a slender arm tracing her hand inches from my face, and I realized. I realized she was seeing the exact same aura on myself. Well, well, she grinned. Another escape E. Your timing couldn't be better. Come in. I could use your help. I said nothing to this, but followed her inside, closing the door frame behind us. Tell me, she said, turning to face me. How'd you find me? I haven't seen or heard from any of the others since we escaped. How'd you manage to get out? Did Asmodeus help you? Yes, it was uh, Asmodeus. I lied, knowing that I now knew the name of Hell's Traitor. He told me to come here to help you. My story was thin, but her arrogance seemed to believe it. Very good, she said, tossing her hair. Best to get to it, then. He's upstairs. Come. She said, taking the lead and heading up the stairs. This way. I followed, trying hard to keep my eyes off her shapely rear. I was just about to get rid of him when you turned up. She threw open a door and revealed a bedroom within. Lying in the bed was... A dead man. His skin the color of old slate, his mouth and neck covered in green bile. Poor Tom. The most terrible stomach ache after dinner. Poor thing went to bed. Seems he must have died in his sleep. He killed him. I rounded on her. Me? She said, her face the picture of innocence, one hand squeezed between her ample breasts like some heroine from a 1930s flick. Of course not. Seems to me like he choked on his own vomit. Now come along, she said, moving over to the bed. Make yourself useful and grab his legs. Before we get started, I said, reaching into my jacket, I have a gift for you, from hell. Something in my voice must have betrayed me. And she turned just as I pulled the knife. What's this? She said, backing away. Her eyes never left my face as she circled backwards, putting the bed between us. You're going back, I said, pacing towards her. Back to hell, where you belong. Wait, she said, holding out a slender arm before suddenly pulling her flimsy nightgown over her head and standing before me in all her naked glory. Why are you doing this? She ran her hands down her smooth, naked thigh. My eyes followed giving her just the distraction she needed, 
With a cry of triumph, she sprang onto the bed and launched a hard kick that sent me square in the face, setting me crashing backwards into a nearby closet. As she ran for the door, cursing, I leapt to my feet, tasting my own blood as I chased after her, catching her on the stairs where I swung the knife blindly, opening up her back in a welter of blood. She screamed out in pain, taking two steps at a time, before hitting the floor and spinning into the hallway. I was still hot on her tail, slashing at her arms and unprotected back. We crashed through a door and into a moonlit kitchen, where she scrambled at a half-open drawer before turning towards me with the largest kitchen knife I had ever seen. So, you want to play fucking games? She hissed her hatred making her once beautiful face almost beast-like and feral. Let's play. With a scream, she charged me, slashing at my face. I felt the blade tear into my flesh, spilling hot blood down my neck. With a cry of triumph, she swung again, this time slashing at my chest, opening on my shirt and slicing at my nipple in two. Screaming with pain, I fell back through the door, landing hard on my back. Seconds later, she barged through, knife raised high for the killing strike, but the blow never came. Instead, she stood there, shaking. Her eyes locked upon my chest as the great wound there began to heal and knit itself close. How? she gasped. I answered her with cold black and steel, driving the blade deep into her thigh, piercing the artery with a spray of blood. She screamed high and loud and turned to shuffle away, but I leapt to my feet and grabbed her by the back of her hair, exposing her delicate throat, which I cut long and deep with practiced ease before casting her now dead body back to the floor. Almost immediately, her skin began to smoke and char. The carpet blackened under her, and she erupted into searing flames. In the roaring inferno, I saw a writhing apparition appear and knew this was her tortured soul, trying desperately to escape, but it was too late. Out of the flames burst a hundred crawling hands that grasped and tore at her. For a second, she reached out to me with an imploring hand. With a final cheated scream, she was gone. I expected the flames to die down, but they continued to grow, revealing a gaping black void below me. I was suddenly falling through a black abyss that seemed to have no end until I landed hard upon a cold stone floor. With a cry and realizing where I was, I staggered to my feet once again. Once again in Lucifer's great hall. The king of hell himself loomed above me from his golden throne. You've done well, he said, grabbing my arm as I staggered to my feet. But, as they say, no rest for the wicked. He waved an arm and a fiery portal opened before me. So, I said, trying to show some bravado. Where to next? He laughed, then patted me on the back. Not so much where. Uh, more like... When? I looked at him, startled. Oh, you didn't think it was all going to be that easy, did you? When? I gasped. Still laughing with an evil glint in his eye, he shoved me through the portal. His terrible laughter followed me down through the eons of time. I was falling through a black void. No up. No down, only an infinite blackness in a sense of hurtling towards some unknown source. I was afraid, desperately afraid, that I would be trapped in this aching void forever. How long before I was driven mad by this vast, lonely darkness? But you're not alone, a voice rang through my mind. Lucifer, I whispered. It was much like this when I fell, he said. And I heard his voice, an endless, aching sadness. The only difference was... agony. Suddenly there was a searing pain in my back as if something that had never been was torn from me. I screamed, bellowed, twisting and thrashing, desperate to escape this inferno of pain. Now you see, Lucifer whispered almost pityingly. Now you understand. I was falling faster and faster. A great white light pierced the veil of darkness, pulling me in, dragging at me like rusty hooks through my flesh, enveloping me, and just like that, there was bare earth beneath my feet once again. The sudden shock of gravity sent me reeling, and I threw up an arm to break my fall, but it was too late. The ground flew up at me with breakneck speed, filling my vision. There was a jarring pain... And I knew no more. 
Well, well, the gravelly voice said as a rude finger prodded me in the chest. You're a fresh one. The old doc will pay a fortune for you. I groaned. My eyes creaked open. The man before me let out a cry and let back his lantern bobbing in the darkness. What's this? Still alive, are you? He said, slinking forward. Well, old Tom and take care of that. From his scruffy-looking waistcoat, he dragged out a viscous-looking billy club. Now you just stay right there, and old Tom will have you off to the angels in no time at all. No angels, I croaked. Only devils. And then off to hell you go, he snarled through rotted teeth. As he raised the club for the killing strike, from behind me rose a dark shadow, a rotting arm oozing with maggots, wrapping itself around his neck. A face, skull-like and black with rot, came into the light, its tattered lips whispering against his throat. Hell is my dominion, friend. Only I decide who goes there. The man let out a shriek of fear, but it was cut off as the arm clenched tight around his throat. There was an audible snap, and he fell to the ground in a dusty heap. Mmm, the corpse grinned. That was fun, like twisting the lid off a candy jar. Wonder if he has a gooey center. I coughed nervously. <coughs> Lucifer, is that you? The corpse sighed, and its eyes rolled wetly in its head. No, it's Pablo Escobar. Who the fuck do you think it is? Where am I? Whose body is this? I said, looking down at a hairy hand with thick, brutal fingers. Questions, 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 he said, kneeling down beside me. He was all I could do not to retch at the smell of him. You're looking a little green around the gills, Mr. Davis. Is something wrong? No, I replied. Peachy Keen. You're sure? He whispered, drawing closer until I could feel his fetid breath on my cheek. Y y yes, my lord, I stammered. Well, that's just fine then, he said, drawing back. Now to answer your questions. You're in the body of a dead man. A cholera victim, to be precise. And for your whereabouts, you're in London. The year of our lord, 1832. You're shitting me, I said, struggling upright, my back pressed against the slime-covered wall. I was suddenly aware of the sound of water in the background and muffled movements up ahead. What is this place? I asked, trying to peer through the gloom. It's a sewer, Mr. Davis, Lucifer replied. You have now been upgraded to the level of a floating turd. <laughs> As for this one, he said, kicking the dead man. He's a corpse peddler. The graveyards are becoming a risky business, and he knew that people had been disposing of their dead neighbors down here, so he thought he would pop down and see if he could find himself some fresh meat. Yeah, but why? Mm. Not big on our history, are we, Mr. Davis? He steals dead bodies and sells them to unscrupulous doctors. All in the name of advancing medicine. The man you're looking for is an acquaintance of his. Although, a little viler. He doesn't wait for someone to die. He makes them die. Then sells their nice, fresh bodies. And he's one of the escapees? Yes. Lucifer nodded. A man by the name of Albert Foster. What does he look like? I asked, climbing to my feet. Ah, uh, well, now that's the question, isn't it? You left the file I gave you back on Earth when you destroyed that lovely Miss Thompson, and for that, you have to pay a forfeit. He grinned. Tell me, have you ever heard of necromancy? I was just about to answer, but he waved it away. A rhetorical question, old boy. A rhetorical question. Come, he said, kneeling by the corpse of old Tom and waving me down beside him. Now take your fingers and gouge out his eye. What? Why? 
He grabbed me then, his rotten, bone-like finger digging into my throat. Do it, or I swear by all of hell's minions, I will tear open your bowel and stuff your mouth with your own shit. Yes, master, I croaked. For a moment, his grip tightened before reluctantly letting me go. Still, a dangerous light burned in his eyes, and I knew if I didn't hurry... I'd be tasting my own shit before the night was through. Without another word, I thrust my fingers into the dead man's eye socket and grimaced. Tore the bloody eye free. Good. Good. Lucifer crooned. Now say the name of the man you seek and pop it right into your mouth. Uh... Uh, Albert Foster, I stammered. So great was my fear of Lucifer that I didn't hesitate, but put the bloody eye straight into my mouth. Now chew it, he demanded. With a grimace, I bit down hard, feeling a cold, jelly-like substance fill my mouth. A face was forming now, a, a man with a broad face and hollow cheeks. A scar ran down the side of his unshaven face, and his eyes were seedy and filled with a stupid animal cunning. I have it, I choked. Well, that's just grand, <laughs> Lucifer laughed. Now swallow it. At the thought of it, I began to retch. I swear by all that is unholy, if you spit it out, you're going straight back to hell. That really didn't help the situation, and for a moment, I thought with my stomach... But in the end, I managed to keep it down. That's good, Mr. Davis. That's very good indeed. Now, talking of things that you have forgotten, you may need this, he said, drawing the hellbound dagger from behind his back. I was just reaching for it, when with a laugh of glee, he thrust it hard into my thigh. With a scream, I fell back down, cradling my wounded leg. Looking on in horror as the skin around the wound began to smoke and blacken. You may want to pull it out before it spreads, Lucifer said thoughtfully. With a cry of pain, I wrenched it free. Watching in wonder as the skin began to immediately knit together and heal. Well, I'm glad to see that still works, he said, looming above me. Fuck you. I spat, suddenly furious. What if I said no? Stick your fucking job. Get someone else to do your dirty work. He moved then. Fast as lightning, his face pressed hard against mine. Render unto me, Caesar, the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. He grated at me through blackened teeth, and I could feel a terrible heat radiating from him. I will let you, he said, licking the side of my face with slime-covered tongue. Figure out who is your god. And just like that, he was gone, leaving a rotten corpse in his wake. Hurriedly, I wiped the foulness from my cheek and climbed to my feet, scooping up the glowing lantern as I went. The sewer was dark, the walls covered with all manner of foulness. Tunnels seemed to lead off in every direction, and I began to despair of ever finding my way out of this place. Just then, I felt a scratching at my feet. Looking down, I saw a small mouse looking up at me. Expectantly. What are you? I asked. My spirit animal? The creature didn't reply, thankfully, but scurried off a short way before standing on its haunches and staring at me with black, beady eyes. When I made no move to follow, it scampered back and began gnawing in my work boots savagely. Okay, okay, I said, shaking the little brute free. I can take a hint. Let's go, then. The little fiend squeaked excitedly and scampered away. This time, I did not hesitate, but followed swiftly behind. In no time at all, we came to a rusting ladder... They led upwards to a heavy-looking manhole cover. There, the creature stopped and just stared up at me. So what do you want? I asked. A graham cracker? Go on, get lost. I think I can take it from here. 
It looked as if to leave before turning back around and trotting towards me. Cocked its leg, almost dog-like, and pissed on my booted foot. Yeah, well, fuck you too, I grumbled, starting up the ladder. I hope you get gang-fucked by a sewer rat. But the creature had already slid off into the darkness. The manhole cover was cold, dank, and heavy. But after some heaving and groaning, I managed to work it loose and push it to one side, praying that no one would see me emerge from the darkened tunnels. But the cobblestone streets were silent, covered with a thick fog that hid my tattered figure as I quickly scrambled free. Once again, I let loose upon the world of men. The question now was where to go. I knew the face of my intended victim, but not his location. Wiping the worst of the filth from me and sticking to the shadows, I moved to the mouth of the alley and peered into the lamp-lit street. It was pretty quiet. A few people walked by, most of them seeming to weave drunkenly. The houses were silent with only the odd light flickering from deep within. Just then, a woman in a tattered-looking dress with a large bonnet on her head staggered by. She saw me and smiled before stumbling over. Evening, Governor. For only a half penny, I can send you to paradise, she said. Massaging her crotch through her filthy dress, I recoiled at the stench of her gin-soaked breath and felt around in my pockets, coming up empty. Sorry, I said. Seem to be a little short on coin, but I wonder if maybe you can give me a little information. She had already turned to leave. You can go straight to hell, she cursed over her shoulder. Been there, I said, catching her around the wrist and dragging her into the alleyway. She let out a shriek, which I cut short as I wrapped my hand around her neck and began to squeeze. In no time at all, she was unconscious. There was a, a dark part of me that wanted to keep on squeezing, but I, I pushed it away. I, I wasn't that person. Not anymore. Lying her down, I quickly rifled through her dress until I found a small leather purse amongst the many folds. The purse was heavy. Looks like you had a busy night, I said, tearing it loose. Sorry for this, but needs must. And charity will buy you a one-way ticket to heaven. Leaving her there, I headed into the street. I still had no idea where I was going. But now, at least, I had some money in my pocket. Perhaps I could buy a little information. Lucifer had told me that the man he had murdered down in the sewer was a friend of the one I was seeking. A local man, perhaps. That's when it came to me. A good place to begin would be the local tavern. Drink always makes men's lips loose. Perhaps if I asked the right questions and greased a few palms, I could get the information I so desperately needed. I now had a plan. A thin one. But a plan, nevertheless. Feeling more confident, I headed into the mist-shrouded streets of Victorian London. It didn't take me long to find what I was looking for. Only a couple streets over, I found a body-looking tavern. From inside came the coarse laughter of men and the drunken shriek-like giggling of loose women. Taking a deep breath, I pushed open the swinging door and headed inside, making my way through the smoke-filled room until I reached the bar. There I turned to face the milling crowd, wondering where to start. It was the girl I noticed first. She was sat in a dingy corner nursing a drink. She was young. It would have been pretty except for the livid scar that ran down her face, petering out along the bridge of her nose. She sighed, looking round at the milling men, but none of them met her eye. She sighed again and threw back her drink before standing to leave. Quickly, I pushed through the room until I stood before her. Hello? I smiled. She smiled back, but there was a hardness to her eyes. Guess you'd be wanting a discount on account of this, she said, tracing a slender finger down her scar. No need for that, I said, drawing closer. Do you have a place we can go? Upstairs. Big John likes to keep things in-house. I followed her gaze, locking eyes with the big man behind the bar who pulled out a piece of hard wood from under the bar and thumped it ominously into his palm. The message was clear. No trouble. I gave him a quick nod before following the girl upstairs and into her shabby lodgings. As soon as the door closed, she fell onto the bed and hiked up her skirt, 
revealing her flesh to me. Gently, I pushed it back down. I don't want that. I just want to talk. She laughed then. Never had a man that wanted to use my mouth for talking. I ignored that and dug in my pocket, throwing a few coins onto the bed. Her eyes lit up greedily and she scooped up the money and quickly secreted them away. What is it you want to know? I'm looking for a man, a corpse peddler. Maybe a murderer? He has a scar on his face, much like your own. Goes by the name of Albert Foster. Well, you're in luck then. Everyone around here knows awful Albert. You could have just asked at the bar and saved yourself some money. Thinking of giving me a rebate, are you? I said, rubbing my fingers together. Not bloody likely, she scoffed, her eyes narrowing. And if you try to take it off me, I will cut you. I held up my hands harmlessly. Money's yours. I just need to find him. Could be in a few places. You could try the Black Dog on Winchester Street. He has a room there. Although, this time of night, you might want to try Faith Hill Cemetery. He and his crew pay the local constabulary a fair few copper to look the other way while they pillage graves. And with so many deaths lately, business is rather good. Where is this cemetery? I asked, excited now. She shrugged. A couple streets over. Faith Hill is at one end of the street, the black dog at the other. That's why he hangs there, close to his place of business. Thanks, I said, turning to leave. You may want to be careful, she called after me. Albert's a real bad fella. I turned to her. So am I. She must have seen something in my face that caused her to recoil. Go on, then. Get, she said in a trembling voice. Before I call Big John on ya. I nodded. And left her there. A scarred waif, living in her own version of hell. Less than an hour later, I stood outside the rusting gates of Faith Hill Cemetery. Deep from within, I could just make out a faint glowing light in the hushed tones of men amongst the leaning tombstones. It can't be this easy, I whispered into the night as I scaled the iron gates, landing hard before pulling out the hellbound dagger and creeping behind a nearby crumbling gravestone. Using the shadows for cover, I crept through the darkness, the voices growing louder. I'm too cold for this kind of work, one of the men growled. Ground's almost completely frozen. Stop your bitch and get on with it, larger of the two men spat, lifting a lantern over the half-defiled grave, giving me a glimpse of his face. Albert, I hissed. What was that? The other man said, spinning in the direction. Fuck, I cursed, knowing I had blown my cover. I stepped out from the shadows and faced them. I have no truck with you, friend, I said to the man holding the pick. Best you be on your way. The man said nothing, but with a cry of outrage, charged me. His pick held high for the killing stroke. I waited, letting him come on, but at the last second, as the pick whooshed through the air towards me, I ducked low, dragging the blade across his unprotected midriff. The blade cut long and deep, spilling his intestines onto the leaf-strewn floor in a bloody heap. The man fell to his knees, his trembling hands hovering over his stomach like a crippled butterfly. He tried to speak, but I ended his suffering with a stroke of my blade. I turned the face the now silent Albert Foster, who had watched the whole thing, with a look of bored amusement on his craggy face. You're him, then, he said, backing away from my approach. The slayer of the damned, Lucifer's bitch, as Modius said you'd be coming for us. You're going back to hell, I growled showing him the blood-soaked blade. Really? He laughed. Boy, are you in for such a surprise. Suddenly, he stopped his backpedaling, and he charged me, his grimy fists bursting into flames. What the fuck? I screamed, just managing to avoid his flaming knuckles. A gift from Asmodeus, he chuckled. I'm gonna burn you up, lapdog. I was panic-stricken now. This was not going according to plan. Still, I had the knife. All I needed was one clear shot, and this nightmare would be all over. Come on, then, I said, trying to goad him. Lucifer will stab you with hot irons for your insolence. 
With a cry of outrage, he lunged at me, but I feigned to the left, drawing him in as I sliced the blade across his arm. With a scream of pain, he backed away, wincing at his smoking flesh. You're mine now, I laughed, running towards him, my blade held high. And that's when my feet tangled in the body of his dead friend, and I went down hard, the blade flying from my grasp. With a roar of triumph, he leapt upon me, pummeling me with his flaming fists. Everywhere a blow landed, my skin began to blacken and burn. I screamed into the night. Half crazed with pain, I tried desperately to throw him off of me, but he was too strong. All I could do now was pray that the end would come soon. The pummeling continued until I was nothing but a burnt-out husk, yet still, I would not die. I could finish you now, Foster goaded, but I prefer to leave you here for the rats. You don't have much time left. What time you do have, will be spent in pain. He stood up then, and undid his rough trousers. I'm not without mercy. See, soothing balm for your terrible wounds. Laughing, he began to piss all over me. There you go, he said, adjusting his clothes. You tell Lucifer when you get back down to hell, you can kiss my hairy ass. And just like that. He was gone, fleeing into the night. I lay there for what seemed like an eternity, waiting for my smoldering flesh to heal, but nothing happened. I was just about to give up all hope when I noticed a movement as something small scurried towards me through the gloom. At first I thought it was a rat coming to feast on my smoking flesh, but it wasn't. It was a squirrel. Small gray squirrel that ran up my leg before bounding onto my chest. Holy shit! It squeaked. Did you see that? That was amazing! The flashing knife, the fiery fists, the bobbing and weaving. That was like a Saturday night blowjob with popcorn. Holy shit! Lucifer, I croaked. Glad you're so entertained. He looked at me with his beady black eyes as if seeing me for the first time. <laughs> well, look at you, Mr. Davis. You're a real mess. Not even the power of renewal is gonna fix this one. You just wait right there. I'll be back in just a jiffy. After what seemed like an eternity, he returned, bobbing along the ground, a swaying man following, laughing and muttering to himself. He stopped close by, giving the drunken man time to catch up. Hey, little fella, the man hiccuped, squinting his eyes. Where'd you go? Over here, Lucifer squeaked. The man staggered over, noticing me laying on the ground. Can you see this? He said, ignoring my burnt state. A talking squirrel. I want to be rich. I'll sell him to the circus. Prepare yourself, Mr. Davis, Lucifer said. When I bring him down, you catch and hold. I'll do the rest. Hmm. Where to start, he tittered. Oh, well, might as well go for the nuts. I was just about to reply when the squirrel lunged forward, biting onto the man's groin. He let out a scream of surprise and tripped over his own feet, falling heavily nearby. With the last of my failing strength, I rolled onto my side, grabbed his flailing arms. Instantly, I felt a sensation like falling, constricting for a second. There was only blackness, and then I was there upon the ground, looking through a fresh pair of eyes. I just lay there for a moment, stunned, until the squirrel took a swipe at me, flaying open my cheek. With a cry, I pressed my hand against the bleeding wound, feeling it instantly begin to heal and knit closed under my probing fingers. Well, Lucifer said, looks like everything's back in place. What the hell was that? I said, sitting up. With a flaming f fist, I mean. Looks like our enemy has given our escapee friends a whole new set of tools to work with, Lucifer said thoughtfully. Asmodeus, I said quickly. The name of our enemy is Asmodeus. He laughed at that. I hardly think so. Asmodeus is nothing more than a minor demon in the last circle of hell. Someone is telling lies, Mr. Davis. Our true enemy has yet to reveal himself, but not to worry. This is my end of things. What you need to concern yourself with is your end of the deal. I want... Mr. Foster, back in hell, where he belongs. But how? I asked, tottering to my feet. He's so much stronger than I am. Again, he sighed. Use your brain, Mr. Davis. That animal cunning that helped you murder so many. 
Find his weakness, or perhaps in this case, his greatest strength. Just get him back in hell. You have 24 hours. Fail me, and no true torment. And just like that, he was gone. Leaving behind a very angry squirrel that chattered at me in disgust before scrambling away up a nearby tree. I spent the rest of the night flailing about in the dark, looking for the hellbound blade. Just as the first rays of light began to stain the darkness, I found it, lying at the feet of a nearby stone angel. I was tired. More tired than I'd ever been, and yet I knew I couldn't rest. Foster believed me dead. And that was my greatest advantage. I had to move against him now, when he believed himself safe and secure. The Black Dog Inn. I whispered into the coming dawn. That's what the girl had said. He had lodgings at the Black Dog Inn. The streets were still blessedly free of people. The only activity was an old woman setting up a rickety-looking flower stand and the few drunks who had staggered home to whatever hovel they had inhabited. Gently, I tried the front door of the Black Dog, finding it locked. Nothing's ever easy, I muttered, heading down the side of the building where I came to a weed-strewn yard. Bits of broken glass lay littered all about, twinkling like diamonds in the coming dawn. There was a small set of double doors set low in the back of the building, held loosely together with a flaking chain and rusty padlock. It only took two strikes of the hellbound dagger to send it flying free. I waited there a moment to see if the noise had attracted any attention. When no cries of alarm were raised, I gently lay open one of the doors and climbed inside. I found myself in a cold, damp cellar. The ceiling was low and covered in cobwebs. The air stank of stale beer and sharp tang of homemade gin. Heading across the room, mindful of the broken glass and grime underfoot, I headed towards a rickety-looking ladder that led up towards a rough-cut trap door. Slowly I climbed, wincing at every creak and groan as I pushed at the door, praying it wasn't locked. Fortunately, this time my prayers were answered and the door swung easily open, admitting me into the upper floor bar room. I was expecting the place to be empty, so you can imagine my surprise when I rose from behind the bar only to be greeted by a room full of people. Thankfully, they were all asleep. Well, actually, they were, they were all dead drunk. Whores, vagabonds, gentlemen alike were passed out over tables, others snoring loudly from whatever position they had managed to pass out in. I crossed the room silently, heading to a nearby doorway, checking slack faces as I passed, but Albert Foster was not among these merry assortment. The girl had said that he had lodging upstairs, same stairs I was now on. My back against the wall, creeping through the gloom, the knife grasped tightly in my sweating fist, I was afraid and not ashamed to admit it to myself. In our last encounter, Albert had bested me with ease. If it wasn't for Lucifer's intervening, I would... I'd probably be in my freezing cell or worse. I had a feeling Lucifer could get real creative with those who dared to fail him. There were three rooms left on the floor. The first one was empty the only furnishing a pair of torn, tattered curtains. The second contained only a single cot, forlorn and empty. I was coming to the last room at the end of the hall now, sweat running down my face. I grasped the tarnished handle and threw open the door. Albert Foster was in his bed. His eyes widened in panic. I leapt across the room, dagger raised high, sweeping down towards his prone form. At the last minute, he ducked under the covers like a child afraid of the dark, just as my blade pierced his squirming form. Something was wrong. Terribly wrong. With a cry, I threw back his filthy blanket. It was immediately assaulted by hundreds, no, thousands of swarming cockroaches. I fell backwards, landing hard on my ass, but the creatures ignored me, heading towards the open window before falling into the street. Son of a bitch! I cried, leaping to my feet. No way you're getting away! I slammed a boot heel down on one of the scurrying insects, which exploded in a crimson smear. I saw the color of its blood and began to laugh, stamping on the remaining creatures in a kind of ecstasy frenzy, fancying I could almost hear their screams. When the last of them was crushed underfoot, 
I rushed to the window just in time to see the scurrying pile warp and transform back into the loathsome form of Albert Foster. Oh, well, almost. He was cradling the bleeding stump of his left hand to his chest, from which three of his five fingers were now torn and shredded stumps. As he glared up at me, I caught the last of the fleeing cockroaches and slowly crushed it in my fist. From down in the street, Albert Foster screamed as his nose erupted in a red welter. Run! I grinned down at him. I'll even close my eyes and count to ten. Fuck you! He screamed up at me before turning and fleeing up the street. A bloody trail behind him. I was after him. Lickety split, leaping from the high window, feeling my ankle break as I landed hard. I ignored the pain, racing after him, feeling my bones almost immediately begin to knit and heal. From across the opposite side of the road came a shrill whistle. I looked around just in time to see a rather large policeman charging at me, baton raised. Drop the knife, he yelled. He was only a few steps away when a black cat suddenly shot out from a nearby alleyway, tangling in his legs, causing him to trip and fall, his helmet flying from his head as he broke his face on the pavement. The cat grinned at me through needle-sharp teeth before dropping me a sly wink and searing off in the shadows. Albert Foster, even injured, had now managed to gain a little distance between us. Cursing, I raced after him, desperate to finish this crazy nightmare. I was gaining on him now. My eyes fixated on the back of his exposed neck. I was just about to take a swing at him when he suddenly veered to the left, crashing through a nearby doorway. The building was large, almost a small warehouse. It was dark inside and reeking of bathtub gin. I heard a clutter and a curse. I ran down a narrow hallway that opened up into a large room filled with jars and kegs. At the back of the room, breathing heavily, was Albert Foster. His back pressed against the stone-cold wall. Nowhere left to run, Albert, I hissed at him. You're going back to hell, where you belong. Come on, then, he growled, stepping forward. We'll see who's exactly going where. I don't need two hands for the likes of you. Just like last time, he raised his hands before me, but this time, only one burst into hellish flames. Still, I had tasted those flames once, and had no desire to do so again. He laughed at me then, sensing my doubt. That's a nice little pig sticker you got there. Let's see if we can get close enough to use it. Lucifer's words suddenly echoed through my mind. Use his greatest weakness against him, or perhaps his greatest strength. You're right, I laughed at him. I don't need this anymore. That said, I launched the dagger at his face. The second it left my hand, I rolled across the room and scooped up the liquid-filled jars. <laughs> you missed, he laughed, turning towards me. Did I? I shot back, throwing the glass jar at him with all of my might. Snarling, he batted it away with his flaming fist, causing it to explode like a bomb in midair, drenching him in almost pure alcohol. He began to shriek and dance, his clothes and his hair on fire, giving me just the opening I needed. Dodging the burning figure, I scooped up the hellbound blade and buried it deep in his lower back, severing his spine, causing him to collapse onto the filth-covered floor. His flesh melted like molten wax. Once again, tearing hands appeared out of the flames, dragging him down Albert Foster's writhing soul as it tried to escape his burning body. I'll see you in hell, Albert. I smiled into his screaming face. Seconds later, he was gone, and I was falling once again, tumbling back into Lucifer's great hall. Only this time, it was not stone I landed upon, but flesh, piles and piles of reeking flesh. There were bodies and chunks of bleeding meat scattered all over Lucifer's great hall. The fallen one himself was sat upon his great throne. His armor was dented, and an ugly red scar ran down the side of his left cheek. What the hell happened here? I grimaced, wiping blood from my hands as I stumbled to my feet. What's this? He grinned at me through fanged teeth, his eyes burning like hot coals. This was a revolt, a minor one, but a revolt nonetheless. A minor one? I gasped, taking in the devastation all around me. He shrugged. Minor demons driven mad by another's power, sent against me to test my might. What do you think, Mr. Davis? Did I pass? Flying colors, my lord, I quickly answered, terrified by the light of madness that danced in his crimson eyes. So who's next? 
I said quickly, desperate to be out of his presence. Things have changed, he said, glaring down at me. I have more need of information right now than anything else. I'm afraid our lost souls will just have to wait. You're going on vacation. Hawaii? I blurted. He laughed then. <laughs> I'm afraid not. And once again, he clicked his fingers. And I was falling. I awoke upon a perfectly manicured lawn. It was dusk and the sun was just starting to set. For a moment I thought myself back on Earth, but... But something was wrong. Terribly wrong. The sinking sun was a burning black hole in a crimson sky, and the air was thick, syrupy, hard to breathe. From around the corner of the house crept a dark figure all dressed in black. In his hand he held a small flashlight, in the other a sharp knife. The blade was as black as the mask he wore. No, I gasped, backing away. For the love of God, not this! The figure saw me and strolled casually across to where I stood, rooted to the spot. He raised his mask, and my own face grinned back at me. Welcome to Purgatory, Mr. Davis. Do you remember this place? The screams of your first victims. The blood on your face, he said, catching my flowing tears in his fist. Judgment is at hand. Welcome to the reaping. I had awoken in purgatory, confronted by my own self or a ghost of my past at the very least. To be honest, I didn't have much of a clue what was going on. I had tried hard to forget my past and the insanity that had driven me to such wanton acts of cruelty. I tried to stop him, but how does one stop that which has already been? I clawed at him, tried to hold him back, but it was like grabbing a handful of smoke and I was forced to watch as my past self butchered and murdered the married couple within. After it was all over, I sat upon the grass outside and wept. But was I weeping for the murdered couple within, or was, or was it for myself? knowing my past actions that condemn my soul to eternal damnation. I closed my eyes, wondering if this nightmare would ever end. Nope. <laughs> A voice chuckled from above me. I gasped, my eyes flying open. I was back in Lucifer's great hall. The Dark Prince himself grinning down at me from his golden throne, all decked out in a fitted black suit and burgundy tie. For you, it never ends, Mr. Davis. Your soul has been condemned to eternal damnation. In other words, your soul <laughs> belongs to me. Now stand up, stop your wailing. It's grown tiresome over the long years. Years, I said, wiping at my face and climbing to my feet. What do you mean, years? Exactly what I said! You've been gone for quite some time. Time is different over there compared to here. How long? I asked, trying to keep the anger from my voice. How long did you abandon me there? Tut tut, he said, shaking his head. Abandon is such a harsh word. Besides, you had a mission to accomplish. Didn't go exactly to plan with all the weeping and self-pity, but it, it, it did prove a point. After all, he didn't cast you out or try to destroy you. Quite promising, wouldn't you say? You know, Lucifer, I said, growing tired of his games. I don't have a fucking clue what you're talking about. At this, he bursts out into a deep, rumbling laughter. <laughs> Mr. Davis! It gladdens me to see that you have still some balls left. But, to answer your question, ten years you're over there sat weeping in the realm of purgatory that that place between the glory of heaven and the eternal damnation of hell and he let you stay he said and greedily rubbing his palms together that means he's still neutral in all this who i asked my curiosity overriding my rage who's neutral he sighed then becoming bored of the whole damn thing death he glared at me. My brother, 
the angel of death. And he has a part to play in the whole thing. And uh, for now, it would seem he intends to follow the words of prophecy. I opened my mouth to ask another question, but he was suddenly there before me. Black wings exploding from his back, his forehead pushing against my own. I could feel a terrible heat radiating from him. Yes, Mr. Davis, he hissed. Do you have another question? I'm here, after all, to serve your every will, whimsy, and desire. No, master, I cried, falling on my knees before him, smothered in his hatred and madness. The heat intensified all around me, and I screamed, gagging on the smell of my own smoldering flesh. Only when I lay prostrate and broken before him did the burning torture cease. Up, oh, forgive me he said, reaching down and dragging me to my feet. Things are quickly coming to a head. I find myself a bag of nerves these days. I didn't dare ask him what he meant by this. Besides, I was too busy checking my skin, which was still mercifully intact. Anyway, he said, sitting back down upon his golden throne, black wings curled about him. Back to business. I have managed to locate another one of our wayward souls while you were on your little holiday of self-discovery. Tell me. Mr. Davis, are you, by any chance, <laughs> any good with a sword? He grinned at the look of horror upon my face, clicked his fingers, and then I was falling. I awoke to the sound of weeping and groaning, the smell of smoke heavy in the air. I tried to sit up, but I could barely move. I was encased in something, something that groaned and creaked as it as I rose my heavy arms, wrenching what I correctly believed to be some kind of helmet from my head. I immediately looked down the length of my body, and <laughs> I burst out laughing. I was in armor, dressed head to toe in steel plate armor. I was laying on a battlefield, the dead and dying all around me, fires burning, fallen banners shuddered in the wind. You have got to be kidding me, I sighed, my head falling back into the mud. Not even a little bit, a small voice croaked off to my side. Quickly, I turned my head and looked into the beady eyes of a large crow. He was perched upon the body of a dead man, happily feasting on the red ruin where his nose had once been. Enjoying yourself? I've had better, the crow said, shredding flesh, falling from its sharp beak. Are you going to lay there all day? Shouldn't you be about... Our master's business. The blade's over there. It said, nodding towards a gutted horse in the saddlebags. Oops. It said, wings fluttering. Looks like we have company. That said, it quickly flew away, landing on a low-hanging branch of a nearby tree. Just then, a face came up into view. It was a tall man with a scraggly beard, blood-soaked bandage covering the top of his head. Sir Stanley, he beamed grabbing me by the arm and heaving me to my feet. We did think you dead, good sir. Uh, uh, not yet, I said, smiling back at him. It is good to see you, sir. Come, he said, placing a gauntlet-covered hand on my back. We have set up camp to yonder forest. The evil of Draven has been defeated for now. We have burned the bodies of these dead men. They shall no longer rise to plague the living. I said nothing to this. Now was a time for listening and gathering information. Besides, this man obviously knew the man whose body I was now inhabiting, and I didn't want to give myself away. And so we started trampling through the mud towards the waiting camp. Wait! I cried, suddenly remembering the hellbound blade. Quickly, I trotted over to the dead horse and rummaged through the soiled saddlebags, coming up with a blade, which began to glow ominously at my touch. What's that? The other man said, his eyes growing wide as he gaped at the glowing blade in my fist. Witchcraft? Have you forsaken our most sacred cause, my lord? Has your soul been polluted by our most foul enemy? His voice grew louder, more frantic. Just then, the crow landed on my shoulder. You're gonna have to kill this fool now before he draws the wrong kind of attention. It squawked into my ear. It doth talk, the tall man said, his face going deathly pale. Yeah, I said, plunging the blade through his gaping mouth. It doth. I would like to tell you that I felt... something. 
watching him die. Regret, sympathy, even the old bloodlust that used to burn through me like white hot fire, but I. I felt. nothing. Only a cold detachment as he bled out the last of his life into the mud. Nicely done, the crow said, nodding his head in approval. It would seem you are becoming just the man our master wants you to be. I ignored that. It's Draven, I presume. He's the one Lucifer wants me to track down. And what did this one mean? I said, towing the dead man's side. About the dead plaguing the living? Draven is a necromancer and a powerful one at that, able to raise the dead to do his bidding, the crow replied. A gift given to him by our master in exchange for his soul. When his time was up, Lucifer collected. But now, he's escaped Hell's clutches, and our master wants him back. So, get to it, Mr. Davis. And just like that, he was gone, sailing up into the sky. Soon, he was nothing more than a dark smudge against the encroaching night. The first thing I did was take the bloody bandage off the dead man's head and wrap it around my own before trudging towards the distant camp. By the time I arrived, it was almost full dark, the flapping tents and fluttering pennants only dimly lit by the surrounding campfires. The sharp tang of vinegary wine and roasting meat perfumed the air as men sat about, talking softly as they warmed their hands by the fire's flickering glow. Whoever's body I was now inhabiting had obviously been a well-liked fellow, as I was greeted bolsterously by whomever I passed. It was one of these men who approached me on the run, bowing lowly. Sir Stanley, he exclaimed, almost falling over on his feet. I did pray to all saints in heaven for your safe return to us. Uh, my thanks, I said, feigning some confusion and rubbing at my bandaged head. It is I, my lord, he said, looking at me with some concern. Did you not recognize your most old and faithful servant, Stephen? Uh, of course, Stephen, uh, my old friend. It is good to see you again. You are hurt, my lord. You must go see the surgeon at once. It is of no uh, accord, I said. A slight bang to the head, nothing more. I could tell he wanted to argue, but didn't quite dare. In that case, my lord, the Duke of Argyle wishes to see you in his tent. He commands all captains to attend him, to make hasteful plans against the most vile and hateful draven. Come, my lord, he said, leading the way. We must make haste. I followed him into a large tent. The inside was large and ostentatious, with a large oak table surrounded by armored men. Their decorative armor showed their wealth and rank. At the head of the table stood a large man with a great, bristling beard. His piercing green eyes watched me closely as my approach. The man, who called himself Stephen, bowed low and quickly scurried away, leaving me alone under the heavy gaze. A man to my right, dressed in chainmail with a flowing black cloak, coughed politely. Are you quite well, my lord? I turned to him, a strange smile on my face. Quite well, I replied. A knock to the head, a trifling matter. It is good to see you alive, Lord Stanley. The bearded giant rumbled. I could tell by his bearing and place at the head of the table that this was the man in charge, the one Stephen had called the Duke of Argyle. Taking a chance, I bowed ever so slightly. My thanks. May the Lord God give us victory over our most hated enemy in the days to come. That seemed to please him, and he waved me into position around the great table. As you know, he said, slamming a great fist into the table, the vile necromancer Draven has escaped our clutches and retreated to his mountainside keep. I myself did see this coward flee in terror as his forces were so rudely routed by our most valiant troops. At this, the knights around the table let out a roar of approval, laughing and slapping one another on the back. When the noise died down, he went on. This battle was won, but the war is far from over. We must make haste, my lords, and lay siege to his most haunted homestead. He must have no time to raise another army of the dead against us, and so I propose we break camp at first light and apprehend our despicable foe. What say you lords? Again they all roared their agreement, and the meeting was adjourned. I left quickly, hurrying into the night. There I found my man, Stephen, waiting for me. 
Is all well, my lord? He asked, drawing close. Uh, yes. We break camp first thing in the morning. Now, take me to my tent, I said, trying to feign the same superior attitude I had observed by the other lords. I am hungry and battle-weary, and would sleep before our journey doth begin with the rising sun. Of course, my lord, he said, bowing low before leading the way, flaming torch held aloft as we made our way to the eastern edge of the camp. At my approach, men climbed to their feet with a clanking of iron and steel, all of them bowing low, and I realized that these were my own forces, blood-stained and weary from a hard-won battle. I acknowledged them with a smile and a nod of the head, before being led into my own tent. The inside was far less grand than the tent I had just left, but still comfortable, with glowing braziers, rust-covered floors, and small comfortable benches. Come, my lord, Stephen said. Let us get you out of that armor. I stood there as he fumbled with straps and clasps until at last I was free of its heavy grasp. Stephen laid my armor upon a wooden rack before scurrying outside and quickly returned with a steaming bowl of delicious-smelling stew and a flagon of nutty brown ale. I ate the stew quickly, enjoying its rich flavor before drinking the watery ale and heading for a nearby cot. As soon as my head hit the pillow, my eyes closed, and I fell into a dreamlike sleep. I was awoken early the next morning by Stephen, the sun only just staining the horizon. "'You must wake, my lord,' he said, shaking me gently. "'Your men are all assembled, and the captains do gather on the hill to lead our armies into glorious battle.' "'Great,' I mumbled. "'Another day dressed like a tin can.' "'My lord?' Stephen asked, his head cocked quizzically. "'Never mind,' I grunted. "'Just strap me into the damn thing. Let's get on with it.' "'Of course.' No such thing happened. Instead, Stephen insisted that I eat first, bringing me a watery-looking porridge and some more weak ale. I began to wonder who was the master and who was the servant here. Still, I found myself growing fond of the fussy old man who carried his great master with an almost superstitious zeal. After I had eaten and been poured into my armor, I was led outside. What I saw there filled me with the utmost dread and horror. There was a horse waiting for me. A huge war horse covered in armor, a massive beast, a head taller than myself and heavily corded with muscle. I was a city boy through and through, and in my former life had never even touched a horse. Nevertheless, rode one. I think I shall walk today, Stanley, I said, nervously glancing at the great beast before me. The look of horror on his face quickly had me feigning laughter. A, a jest, good Stephen, to lighten the mood. He visibly relaxed and quickly called for two boys who placed a wooden stool before me. Taking a deep breath, I climbed upon it, placing my hand upon the creature's back, noticing the swinging stirrup. I'd seen enough John Wayne movies to know at least what this was, and thrust my foot inside and threw my leg over, landing heavily on the horse's back. The beast snorted angrily and pawed at the earth, my clumsy mounting, but fuck the damn thing, I was more than a little happy I hadn't landed on my ass. I sat there wondering what to do next when Stephen grabbed up the reins and led me towards the waiting captains. We were soon on the move, myself and the other knights in the lead, our men following close behind in good order. We moved through the lush countryside and green forests, and by mid-afternoon we left the woodlands behind and entered a great green meadow, dotted here and there with small lakes and running streams. In the distance, a mountain range ran from east to west before crumbling into rugged foothills. There, the Duke of Argyle pointed towards the mountain range. There is where we will find the home of our loathsome enemy. If we ride hard, we can be at the foot of the mountain before nightfall. Look yonder, my lord, another mounted man exclaimed. Smoke in the valley! A village, perhaps, Argyle said thoughtfully. Burned and pillaged by Draven's retreating army. I volunteer to take a look, my lord, I said, nudging my horse forward, wishing to learn more about my enemy's power. Very well, Lord of Stanley. Take a handful of men. Go see if any doth survive. We shall continue on our journey. Be swift, unless you miss the great battle to come. Very well, my lord, I said, signaling to a handful of men as I rode away. 
the ever-faithful Stephen by my side. The village was a large one of its kind. At least they had the good sense not to burn down the tavern, one of the men snickered as we dismounted. Search the streets. See if you can find any bodies, he commanded, drawing my sword. Stephen by my side. The old man was now dressed in a rusty chainmail shirt, a pot-like helmet on his head. In his hand, he gripped a short stabbing sword. Old looking, but with a keen edge. Be careful, my lord. He wheezed as I gently opened the tavern's door. When no attack came, I entered, keeping a wary eye on the lengthy shadows, but there was nothing. Only overturned furniture, broken pottery, and the smell of stale beer lingering in the air. Over here, my lord, Stephen said, a tremble in his voice. I turned and strolled towards him, taking in blood-spattered walls. Must have been a hell of a fight, I said placing a comforting hand on the old man's shoulder. Aye, my lord, he said. But where are all the bodies? I haven't seen so much as a dead dog since we entered this place. It feels all wrong, my lord. This place reeks of evil. Steady, good Stephen, I said. Just a few more moments, we shall join the rest of our forces. As we stepped outside, a man came on the run. We found the church boarded up and locked. We called out to the survivors, for we heard noises within, but they would not answer. I fear they're too afraid, my lord. Take me to them, I said, following closely behind. As we ventured down the hill, a small, rickety-looking church came into sight. Thankfully, the church was still intact and looked free from any burning or looting. Come out, I commanded, using my most lordly voice. You're safe now! But there was nothing. Only the sound of rustling and scratching within. Break it down, I said to the nearby men who approached the door, swords and axes raised. As soon as the first blow was struck, the doors were suddenly thrown open, and a horde of dead men poured out. It was villagers, slaughtered and raised by Draven's terrible power. It's a trap! Stephen screamed. No shit! I cursed, drawing my sword. Get behind me! But it was already too late. With a cry of outrage, Stephen charged in, slashing, grasping hands and yawning mouths. Damn Stephen! I cried, waiting in after him. A dead man leapt out in front of me, gray eyes glaring with hate. Its black teeth darted from my throat. Quickly, I threw up an arm and arm. Feeling the creature bite down, I rammed my sword into its guts, its steaming pipes and organs splashing into the dirt. And still, he would not go down. The head, my lord! One of my men screamed as he went down under the weight of the dead. Fuck this! I cursed, throwing down the cumbersome sword and dragging the hellbound blade from under my armor. The blade burst into flames as I rammed it in the creature's back, instantly turning the vile thing to dust. Half crazed with fear and adrenaline, I waded into my tormentors, slashing at their rotting faces and desiccated limbs. Wherever my blade sliced flesh, the dead burst into hot flaming dust. After what seemed like hours, I stood alone, my men all fallen beneath the onslaught, the ashes of dead men at my feet, stirred only by the growing wind. From my right came a whimpering groan. It was my manservant, Stephen, lying on the ground. The old man's face was covered in bite marks. His hands hovered like crippled butterflies over his torn and bloody guts. At my approach, he tried to shuffle backwards, but his legs would not work, and he slumped down, his head in the mud. Stephen! I cried, falling on one knee beside him. He saw the glowing blade in my hand and began to thrash. Quickly, I cast it away, cradling the dying man in my arms. Be still now, good Stephen. It's gone. Who are you? He asked, his lips covered in blood. You are not my master. You are not the man I raised as a boy. I saw you fight amongst the dead, he gasped. You were smiling as you... You thrust that accursed blade into them again and again. You reveled in their death. No, Stephen, it is I, I lied, trying to bring him some comfort. He raised a shaking hand and touched my face. Imposter. He spoke his final word, the light dimming from his eyes. And he said no more. Shame that. A voice growled from behind me. The old fool died too quickly. Still, 
If it brings you any comfort, his soul flew straight to heaven. I turned and raged, but stopped when I saw the great wolf that stood before me. Lucifer, I sighed, the one and only. He grinned, revealing dagger-like teeth. You're not going to start that weeping and wailing again, are you? No, I said, scooping up the blade and cutting the armor from me until only a chainmail shirt remained. He was a good man. He should be buried. Why? Lucifer chuckled. Rats need to eat, too. I said nothing to this. I was angry at his disregard and tired of being his lapdog. I feared the things I might say and the inevitable punishment that would follow. Lucifer, perhaps, sensing my mood, ceased his mockery and continued. There is a goat path that leads through the foothills and up into the mountains to Draven's castle. There is a cave there that leads to his dungeon, an escape route if the Dark Wizard should ever be cornered. I will guide you there while Draven is distracted by the Duke's armies. He will slip inside and kill this Oathbreaker. Come now, he said, loping off into the growing shadows. It'll be dark soon, and we have a far ways to go. The climb up into the mountains was a treacherous one, even more so as the shadows lengthened and the day gave way to night. Lucifer was sure-footed, as only a wolf can be. I, however, stumbled and crashed through the forest, holding my breath as we edged our way across narrow ledges and crumbling boulders. At last, we reached the narrow cave entrance, and I could hear the roar of battle from above us. Unable to contain my curiosity, I climbed a little higher to the base of Draven's castle. There, through the pines and swaying spruce, I could see the Duke's forces as they assaulted the castle's reinforced main gates with a stout battle rat. From above, the defenders poured hot oil and cast down huge rocks upon them, decimating the Duke's forces. Not going too well, is it? Lucifer panted in my ear. But that's not really your concern. Although, it may comfort you to know that if you slay Draven, his power shall diminish and his forces will go back to their natural state of decay. Just think of all the suffering you can prevent with a single stroke of your knife. I said nothing to this, but clambered back down to the cave's entrance. You coming? I asked him as I looked inside. Not me, he chuckled. This is your kill, not mine. Besides, I can't interfere with this. It must be you that delivers the final stroke. And why is that? Why is it you don't claim these lost souls of yours? There is a reason for everything, Mr. Davis, and soon you will know more, perhaps more than you care to know. But for now, you must work alone. I do, however, have a gift for you, he said, jumping up and placing his paws upon my shoulders. Before I could even react, he licked my face with his steaming tongue. With a cry, I pushed him away. What the hell are you doing? Look above you, Mr. Davis. Tell me what you see. I suddenly realized that that was it. I could see everything. It was like the night had been driven back and I could see almost as clear as daylight. You should see the look on your face. Lucifer chuckled. Stick with me, kid. He laughed. And all the powers of hell shall be yours. That said... He howled up at the moon and loped away into the darkness. I entered the cave with more confidence, weaving my way past sharp fanged stalagmites, sure-footed as a cat in the darkness. At last, I came to a small set of stone steps, carved out of the very bedrock. Drawing the blade from my belt, I snuck up the stairs, wincing as my booted feet ground and scraped against the dust and grit of centuries. At the top... I came upon a thick iron gate that seemed to lead off into a vaulted chamber of thick, dripping stone. Taking a deep breath, I put my shoulder to the gate, dug in my heels, and pushed with all of my might. But the gate would not budge. Locked, or perhaps just rusted shut. Either way, I was in a world of trouble. Feeling incredibly stupid, I waved my hand over the lock. But nothing happened. Yeah... 
You could have given me that power, I mumbled. What are you? A small voice squeaked from above. A Jedi Master? Use the blade, idiot. It was a bat, hanging upside down and glaring at me with beady eyes. Lucifer, is that you again? But the creature had already gone, flapping away into the night. Yeah, well, fuck you too. I called after it, before raising the hellbound blade, which burst into searing blue flames before my eyes. Quickly, I pushed it against the metal lock, looking on with awe as it slid through the metal like a hot knife through butter, until at last, there was a clunk, and the smoking lock fell from the other side. Wasting no time, I put my shoulder into the gate, and with a squeal of rusted hinges, it reluctantly gave way. I stood there for a moment, tense, waiting to see if the noise had attracted any unwanted attention, but there was nothing, only the faded noises of the battle raging above. Moving silently, I entered the room, seeing the barred cells all around me, and realized I was in some kind of dungeon. I looked into a few cells as I passed, but there was nothing but molded bones, crumbling cloth. Keeping my back against the dripping stone wall, I rounded a corner and almost ran smack bang into a waiting guard. This one was thankfully alive, his eyes wandering as he emerged out of the gloom. Hurriedly, he fumbled for his sword but did not attack. Who are you? he demanded. How'd you get here? I have come for your master, Draven, I said, wielding the hellbound blade before him. I'm gonna send him straight back to hell. Good. The man said, much to my surprise. He's lost his mind. What little of it was left. The way he looked at me. He shuddered. You know what he told me? He told me I'd better serve him dead. So I knew he wanted to make me into one of those, the cursed things. A slave. You should see what he does with them. For the women, I mean. His face turned deathly white. I am not a good man. I've killed, murdered, slain other men, but I swear by the blood of Christ, if I survive this night, I shall join the priesthood and spend the rest of my life atoning for my sins. Here. He tossed a bunch of keys at my feet. Those will open any door in the castle. Draven is in the main hall, surrounded by dead men. Now tell me, how did you get in here, and is there a way out? Yes, I replied. There's an old gate that leads to a small cave system. After that, a goat's path that leads down to the mountainside. My thanks. He had thrown down his sword and hurried past me. Remember your oath, I called after him. Trust me, friend. You don't want to suffer the torments of hell. If he heard me, he gave no sign, but it hurried away. I scooped up the keys and carried them up the stairs. Here I encountered another stout door. This one was also locked, and after fumbling with many keys, I found the one that fit and pushed the door open, just a crack, peering into a narrow hallway, hung with moldering tapestries. I was just about to step out when a dead man shambled past, then another, and another. Following closely behind was a weasel-faced man who cursed them roundly. Move, you sack of bones! Quickly, quickly now! Get to the battlements! As he passed, I reached out an arm, wrapping it around his throat and dragging him through the doorway, kicking it closed behind him, dagger at his throat. If his dead companions missed his company, it didn't show as none came to investigate his sudden disappearance. Who are you? The man squealed, feeling the cold steel against his throat. What do you want from me? I want you to take me to Draven. I grated in his ear. Show me the way to your master. You mad! He gasped. People run from Draven, not at him. Mad? <laughs> Friend, you have no idea. I dug the blade a little deeper until the blood began to flow. Okay, okay! He gasped. I will take you to him. Will we encounter any more guards along the way? Doubtful, he replied. Most of us are upon the battlements, trying to defend the castle. That's good, then. I heard Draven and is in the main hall. Take me there. No. He's gone to the tower now to watch the battle. It's close. Real close. I can take you there. Just please don't kill me. Good. You may live yet. Now let's go. 
I said, kicking the door open, blade at his throat. Quickly, we shuffled down the hall and through old rooms, filled with decaying drapes and rotting furniture until at last, we came to the base of the tower. There I took hold of his greasy hair, dagger at the base of his spine. He headed up the winding stone staircase, the sound of dying men and clashing of steel ringing in my ears as the battle continued to rage outside. When we neared the top, he suddenly stopped. Just round the bend, Draven's quarters. He'll have Meredith with him. I'll go no further. I shall not look on that monstrosity again. Who's Meredith? I asked him, but he only shook his head stubbornly. Draven will know I have betrayed him. I must leave this place at once. You're right, I said, grabbing him by the back of his neck and the seat of his britches. You should leave. He let out a single scream as I ran him into a nearby arch window before casting him into oblivion. If he screamed again, of which I'm quite sure, he was drowned out by the sound of raging battles below. <sighs> okay, Draven, I said, approaching the stout wooden door. Here I come, ready or not. I put my shoulder into the door, expecting it to be locked, but it swung open easily. And I strode in. The room was round and large, decorated with flowing black tapestries depicting all manner of morbid scenes. Dravid himself was sat upon a throne made entirely of human bones, a dark pulsing aura undulating around him. But it was not this that drew my attention, for the thing slumped by his side. The thing had obviously been a woman, but now was an amalgamation of many parts. It didn't have two arms but four, crudely stitched into its enormous ribcage, from which large, sagging breasts hung down, the nipples replaced by glaring eyes. The skull was broad and flattened, the jaw heavy with a drooling, lipless mouth, and just below this, in the throat area, was a second mouth, larger than the first and filled with piranha-like teeth, from which a blackened tongue protruded, as if tasting the air. How do you like her? Draven chuckled. My magnum opus, Meredith. You're one sick puppy, Draven. You can only imagine what Lucifer has in store for you down in the pit. And you think that you'll be the one to send me back? He scoffed. Let me tell you something. The Dark Prince lies like others breathe. What of a pact he's made with you? What of a promise? He'll break it. No, I piss on Lucifer, and I will piss on you for all eternity. Meredith, he commanded, destroy this fool and bring me that pretty little knife of his. As soon as the words left his mouth, the creature leapt to its feet with frightening speed for one so big, but I still had the dagger and the slightest nick upon the creature's flesh, and he would be nothing more than dust on the wind. With a roar, the creature charged me, trying to grab me up in its crushing embrace. I ducked low, meaning to slash its side, but the second set of arms caught me mid-swing, snapping my wrist, sending the hellbound blade clattering across the room. Draven instantly leapt from his chair and, with a roar of triumph, scooped it up. But his roar turned into a bellow of pain as the bone handle turned white-hot at his frenzied grip. Howling, he cast the blade from him, sending it spinning across the room. The creature now had me by the throat. Hammering me against the wall in an act of sheer desperation, I reached out and grabbed one swinging breast and rammed my thumb into its glaring eye. The creature roared in pain, rearing back and giving me enough space to raise my knees, and pissed my legs forward, catching it hard in the midriff, breaking its grasp as it stumbled backwards. Enraged and half-blinded, straight into Draven, sending them both tumbling to the ground in a mass of flailing limbs. <coughs> Titty twister, bitch! I coughed, massaging my throat as I grasped up my blade. The pair had already managed to untangle themselves, the creature up upon one knee as Draven dragged himself away, one leg completely shattered. No, you don't, I said, advancing on the thing, but it was already moving, rolling into me, knocking my legs from under me, setting me sailing over the top of its massive bulk and slamming me into Draven's great bone throne with mind-numbing force. I felt something in my skull give, and my vision began to fade, but only for a moment, as my bones began to re-knit and heal. Still, I lay there, feigning unconsciousness. As the creature crawled towards me, its drooling mouth chomping with anticipation, I didn't move. Not even when the creature tore into my leg. I had endured all the torments of hell. This held little to no comparison to me. That's right, Draven screamed. Eat him up, Meredith! Eat his man parts. Geld that lapdog of Satan. 
The creature reared up, meaning to do just that, and as it started on its downward strike, I suddenly came to life and rammed the hellbound blade into its gaping mouth. Instantly, the creature exploded into hot ash and bone, showering the room with its grisly remains. No! Draven screamed. Oh, I'm afraid so, I said, staggering to my feet, feeling my torn and battered flesh already beginning to heal. Tell me, I said, stamping down on his shattered leg. Does it hurt much? The piercing scream he delivered pretty much told me it did. So I did it again for good measure. In fact, once I started kicking him, it was like I was unable to stop. By the time I stuck the knife in him, he was begging for the death he had so cruelly denied to so many. I obliged him, sending his tormented soul to eternal damnation. And once again, I was falling. Falling into Lucifer's great hall, only this time, I landed on my feet. You're getting better at this, Lucifer said from his golden throne. Is it me? I asked. Or is this getting harder? Oh, definitely, he chuckled. And still, two more to go. So where to next? I asked, eager to be put out of his presence. The Wild West? Ancient Rome, perhaps? No, no, Mr. Davis. I said our wayward souls were displaced in time. I never said strictly in the past. Wait, wait. You mean... He overrode me. As a great songwriter once said, the future is uncertain. And in the end, is always near. The future, I guessed. You, you have to be shitting me. <laughs> he grinned, dropping me a sly wink. And once again, I was falling. I was standing in a desert. The heat was oppressive, almost like a living thing crawling over my skin, and the air was bitterly dry, as if it had long since forgotten the taste of water. A man stood a little way off in the distance, his back towards me. He was dressed in a simple white robe, torn and smeared from his time in the wilderness. His hair was long and flowing where it ran down to his narrow shoulders, and I felt in a way that I knew this man, that I should go to him. I even took a step forward, but I was stopped in my tracks by the gentle sound of weeping. I turned slowly, my eyes widening as I took in the beauty of the angel that sat on a nearby rock, its midnight wings wrapped about its huddled form. Lucifer, I gasped, approaching slowly, the sound of his awful weeping tearing at my heart. Lucifer, I said again, falling onto my knees before him. He looked up at me then, his sapphire blue eyes filled with an agony I could never even dare to comprehend. Best to come away from him, the other man said from over his shoulder. He's failed, and he weeps only for himself. I couldn't break him, Lucifer breathes against my face. I offered him the world. Every imaginable delight known to man would have been his if he would only bow down before me, but, but he would not. I don't understand, I said, reaching for him. He would not bow to me, he suddenly screeched, flying to his feet, a hot wind surrounding him as I fell backwards into the sand, desperately trying to scramble away. He stalked towards me, his face a rigor of hate. His once blue eyes, now a bleeding crimson. But you, he hissed, his hate-filled face looming above me. You are mine. I awoke with a scream, my face pressed against the dry, hard pan floor. I sat up quickly, trying to gather my senses. Bad dream? A small voice tittered. I tried to look around, my eyes swimming in and out of focus. There was a sudden sharp pain, and I cried out, snatching my hand away from a small, scuttling scorpion that emerged from a cluster of nearby rocks. Its claws raised, its stinger dripping venom. I hope.
hope you're not poisonous, I growled, tempted to stamp the little bastard to death. Always, the scorpion said. Not that such things can affect you, Mr. Davis. Lucifer, I sighed, leaning back into the shade of a decaying tree. Where am I? And whose body is this? You are in the future. Well, one possible future, he said, scrambling between my legs. There are many timelines, and this is one of those. Timelines, I said, interested now, despite myself. There's more than one? Oh, yes, Lucifer replied. I've been the downfall of many. <laughs> this just happens to be one of those. Now tell me, Mr. Davis, how do you like it? I sat up a little higher, trying to get a good look around, but there wasn't much to see. Only gray, shattered ground and a few dead trees. The sun sat high in the sky and shone weakly between thick ash-like clouds. I seemed to be in some kind of basin surrounded by high, shattered cliffs. I think this place has seen better days. At this, Lucifer burst out laughing. You are the master of understatement, Mr. Davis. What happened here? I asked, attempting to raise my feet, but Lucifer scuttled forward, thrusting his venomous stinger into my unprotected thigh. I screamed out and fell backwards, my leg on fire. Thought I would turn up the juice on you. Lucifer chuckled, stinger raised threateningly. You do not stand unless I tell you to stand, Mr. Davis. You don't even shit without my permission. You have asked questions. Now sit down and I have the wisdom to listen to the answers. I did as he asked, the pain in my leg already fading. Still, I watched him carefully as he continued. As I was saying, there are multiple timelines, and I've been the downfall of many. This is just such a one. As for what happened here, I caused a little... eruption at Yellowstone Park. Well, actually, a rather huge eruption that wiped out most of the U.S. <laughs> Oh, it was a sight to behold. Molten lava, great clouds of ash spewed into the atmosphere. But the fun didn't stop there. That eruption set off a chain of events. Worldwide earthquakes and tsunamis that wiped out whole continents. Ever heard of the Pacific Ring of Fire, Mr. Davis? The whole thing went up like a tar barrel. Soon the very sun in the sky was blocked from the sight of men. Millions died of hunger, disease. Resources became scarcer and scarcer, and then, you know what they did? What was left of these raging governments? They started to fight each other, Mr. Davis, over what little resources were left. <laughs> Even I was stunned. I have always hated your kind, but I think when those first nukes began to fly, I fell in love with your race. Even if it was only for a short time. Jesus, I gasped. They really did that to one another, even amongst all that death? They did that? Oh, yes, Lucifer replied. And those that are left scratch a living from this torn and battered earth, a hell of their own making. And the soul you're after is here? In this place? Yes, actually, she is. Her encampment is to the east, but you're going to the west. The body you now inhabit belongs to a hunter from that particular colony. Unfortunately, this time he didn't quite make it back with his bag of rats and lizards. He stumbled too far into the waste and found himself trapped in a particularly nasty dust storm. And when you know it, <laughs> he fell victim to a certain venomous scorpion that just seemed to be hanging around. How convenient, I sighed. So why am I going to the west if the soul we're after is in the east? Oh, well, because on this occasion, our little constant will be coming for you. See how easy I've made this little escapade for you? That's her name. Constance? What does she look like? Oh, you'll know her when you see her. In fact, you can hardly miss her, <laughs> he chuckled. Okay, I sighed. Tired of his games. And where's the blade? 
For a moment he was silent before continuing, and I heard something in his voice that I'd never heard before. Embarrassment. The whole time travel thing could be a little tricky, Mr. Davis. The blade should be right here, but it's not. Whether this is interference from our unknown adversary or just my own miscalculations, I am unsure. But the blade is that way, <laughs> he said, pointing one jagged claw to the west. In the lost city. Don't worry. Colony you're traveling to is on the same path on the other side. And all you need to do is pick up the blade on your way through and don't worry about the radiation. It won't hurt you. Much? Radiation? I stammered. What the hell do you mean, radiation? But I was talking to myself. He had already fled, leaving a rather grumpy-looking scorpion behind, which I quickly squashed with a booted heel before standing and rummaging through a nearby dusty bag. Lucifer had been right. The bag contained the loathsome bodies of a few skinny rats and not much else. The only thing of any use was an old battered and cracked compass which I stuffed into my torn jeans. I was also wearing a short jacket patched in various places and a gray scarf wrapped around my neck and lower face to keep the wind at bay. Laying close by was some kind of spear made out of plastic piping and sharpened to a wicked looking point. I shrugged and I picked it up. It was no hellbound blade but it would do in a pinch. Okay, I said, brushing myself off. Let's get this done. The cliffs were further away than I had first thought, and it was growing dark by the time I had reached their base. The night was coming on fast, and the cool air grew colder by the second. I feared that I would have a long climb ahead of me in the dark, but after a little searching, I found a crack in the base of the cliff, just wide enough for me to squeeze through. I wasn't sure if it would lead to the other side, but I was willing to take my chances rather than try to scale those crumbling blackened cliffs. Starting in, my back pressed hard against the rock, shuffling slowly through the sky, a starless blackened void above me. Time took on no meaning. It was only the cold rock and the sound of my labored breathing as I fought my way through. At one point, the passage became so narrow that I had to force my way in, tearing the skin from my forehead and back, ripping up my clothes. I was afraid, terribly afraid I would get stuck. Mummified alive, covered in the dust of eons, until I became one with the rock. Still, I forced my way forward, the bones in my skull starting to squeak, until at last I popped free like a cork from a bottle. There, I fell to my knees, blood pouring from my face as my body once again began to knit and heal. Whether it was fear or just brute exhaustion, I passed out, and I awoke with a rising sun. The first thing I saw was what Lucifer had referred to as the Lost City. If ever a place had been so namely apt, this was it. For the great city before me was indeed lost. The once rearing skyscrapers had crumbled, slumped like skeletal fingers reaching towards the sky. The roads, from what I could make out of them, were cracked and covered with dying grass. Rusting hunks of metal that could have once been cars sat hunched and broken, clinging weeds crawling through their shattered windows and hanging doors. As I drew closer, the air took on a metallic taste, and my skin began to itch and burn, and I believed if I had a Geiger counter in my hand, I would have started to run the other way. Still, I pressed on, wondering what city this had once been and if it really mattered anymore. After all, this world was dead, the remaining denizens clinging to life as tenuous as the surrounding weeds. I passed a park, the rustling swings creaking in the wind, an overturned slide lying like some forgotten relic amongst the tall grass. There were also other things in the grass, shining bones bleached white over the long decades. I tried hard not to look at those as I moved further into the city, past shattered buildings and crumbling shops. The air was getting thicker and harder to breathe. I looked down at my hand that still clutched the makeshift spear, and noticed a small group of sores breaking out across my skin, only to heal before breaking out into weeping sores once again. I realized, even with my accelerated healing, I couldn't stay in this place too long. 
I had been in the city perhaps an hour, wandering aimlessly, not sure what to do or where to go when the attack came. I was just standing at a crumbling intersection, mostly blocked by overturned cars and rusting wreckage. And there was a howling screech to my left, and four men suddenly rushed at me from a darkened doorway. With a cry, I leapt backward, spear held out before me, unable to believe that anyone could still live in such a state. For the men before me were almost zombie-like in appearance, emaciated, their gray skin covered in running boils and weeping lesions. In their withered hands, they carried an assortment of rusting weapons, and yet still, they seemed imbued with a frightful vitality. Seeing the weapon in my hand, they spread out in a semicircle, hissing and growling at me like feral beasts. One of the men raised an arm and launched a rusting hatchet at my face, which I just managed to avoid by twisting to the side. Enraged that he missed, he howled his frustration and charged me, but I was ready for him. As he came on, I thrust my spear forward, piercing his throat in a bloody welter. He went down hard, dragging the spear from my hands. The other two men, seeing their opportunity, charged forward. A machete sailed through the air, burying deep in my lower ribcage. The two men, thinking perhaps it was all over for me, backed away, but I only grinned at them, wrenching the machete free from my body, already healing the massive wound as they stood there gaping. I brought the machete, whistling down, burying it into one man's skull. The other man turned to flee, but the remaining man, the biggest of the four who had not attacked, thrust the man back towards me. Off balance, he staggered, almost falling, his arms flailing. Seeing my opportunity, I grabbed his arm and span him around, thrusting him into nearby wreckage and twisting metal. It impaled him on a broken grinder that burst from his chest. For a moment, his eyes widened, his blood erupted from his mouth, and then he lay still. Quickly, I turned to the other man who grinned at me, revealing black, shattered teeth. From behind his back, he drew the hellbound blade, but his leer soon turned to grimaces of pain as the blade turned white hot in his hands at my presence. With a scream, he dropped it to the ground, holding his weeping hand before him. I dived for the blade, but I was too slow, and he kicked it away from me, leaping onto my back, dragging me down on top of him. His forearm wrapped around my throat. Reaching over my head, I managed to find his face. Groping for his eyes, I thrust my fingers deep into the socket. He howled in pain, loosening his grip, giving me just enough space to throw a couple of elbows into his ribs. Moaning and holding his cracked side, he slackened his grip, finally allowing me to struggle free. I clambered to my feet, trying to learn how to breathe again, but still, he wasn't done for he was already staggering to his feet. Cursing, I rushed forward. Just as he straightened, I grabbed him by the tattered ears and headbutted him viciously into the face. There was an explosion of blood and teeth, and he went down hard. Instantly, I was upon him. Straddling his prone form, I grabbed him by the hair and began to smash his head into the cracked pavement over and over again until nothing remained but red ruin. At last he stopped his twisting and convulsing, and he lay still. Exhausted, I rolled free of him and lay upon my back, covered in a cold sweat and breathing hard. Once I had recovered, I stood and staggered over to the hellbound blade and scooped it up. Hello, old friend, I said, enjoying the feel of it in my hand. Did you miss me? did. Gave no sign as I stuffed it into my belt and quickly covered it with my ragged jacket. My body had mercifully started to heal. I checked my compass and carried on towards the west, eager to leave the rotting remains of the dead city behind. The rest of the journey through the city was uneventful, yet whether this was just my own paranoia or the lengthening shadows pulling on my frayed nerves, I had the distinct feeling my every movement was being tracked and followed. I only relaxed and breathed a sigh of relief. Then the city's spires and broken towers were no more than a smudge on the darkening horizon. I was entering a kind of swampland now, stale water and stunned vegetation on either side of the broken asphalt road. I was hungry and incredibly thirsty, but since neither dehydration nor starvation could really harm me, I put them from my mind and doggedly stroll on. Soon it became too dark to travel and I hunkered down in the middle of the road, resigning myself to another night in the wilderness. Pulling my ragged jacket tight about me, I fell into a restless sleep. I awoke with the coming dawn, only to come face to face 
with a mangy-looking feline that sat close by, gnawing on the remains of a ragged-looking fish. Hey, you, uh, fancy sharing some of that? I remarked irritably, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Even better. Go catch me one? Ha! Sorry, Lucifer replied, smiling at me from between needle-like teeth. I'm afraid this was the last fish in the whole stinking swamp. It tastes all the better for it. Feeling the rigors of the wasteland, are you, Mr. Davis? Well, hopefully now you have the knife back and you can be about your business. The settlement you seek lies only a couple of miles along this very road. Mm. You couldn't have told me this yesterday and saved me another uncomfortable night on the road, I huffed. He chuckled then. Where would be the fun in that? Besides, this isn't a fucking Walt Disney epic. What would you have me do? appear as a fluttering firefly to guide your dainty feet to your next destination. Give you a foot rub? Check your prostate, perhaps. I wonder, he said, cocking his head quizzically, if you could fit a full-sized cat into a human rectum. I stood up quickly. Just along this road, you said. The cat grinned wickedly. Yes, Mr. Davis. Just a couple of miles. We have to take care of something first. Now, Neil he commanded. I did as he bid, falling on my knees before him. Good. Now take the blade and open up your palm with it. Cut deep. I really want to see the blood flow. I did as he asked, wincing as the hellbound blade slid easily through the meat of my palm and the blood began to flow like a crimson waterfall. Lucifer's eyes lit up greedily, and he stalked forward, his tongue spittling, becoming serpent-like as he lapped greedily at the bleeding hand. Do you mind telling me what the fuck you're doing? I gasped at the pain, eager to be rid of his touch, but he ignored me, licking deeper and longer, his tongue probing the open wound. At last, he withdrew, sitting back on his haunches, a look of smug satisfaction on his face. All gone, he tittered. What? What's all gone? I asked, checking myself over. That annoying little aura of yours. That last vestige of hell that clings to your forsaken soul. This is a stealth mission, and that aura of yours is a dead giveaway. It's never been a problem before, I said, ripping at my shirt to make a makeshift bandage for my still bleeding hand. Indeed, he replied, but then again... You've never been offered up for sacrifice before now, have you? Sacrifice? I said in a strangled voice. What the hell are you talking about, sacrifice? Follow the road, he said, scampering away. The settlement you seek is just over the next horizon. That said, he hurried away and soon vanished amongst the stunted growth, leaving me stood bewildered on the shattered highway, my stomach tied in tight knots. After a few deep breaths, I got my whirling emotions under control, and I carried on along the road. After all, what choice did I really have? Besides, I thought to myself, Lucifer must have some kind of plan. It was far from his own best interest to leave me hanging out to dry. So I hurried onward, eager to leave this living hell that this world had become. The settlement itself was nothing more than a few crumbling buildings, flapping tents and rusting lean-tos. At my approach, an alarm was sounded, and a bunch of ragged-looking men came on the run. Michael, their leader scowled, stepping forward. The man was tall, skeletal frame, with hawk-like nose and watchful eyes. We thought you dead, he growled, a hint of disappointment in his voice. Not yet, I replied. Not sure how to proceed. Show me, then, he said, tearing the satchel from my shoulder. Thankfully, I had strapped the hellbound blade to my inner thigh with the ragged remains of my shirt, and the satchel was now blessedly empty. Yet somehow this seemed to please the big man, who grinned at me shark-like from between rotting teeth. Oh, Michael, he shook his head with exaggerated sadness. What did I say would happen if you came back from the wastes empty-handed once again? Three days you've been gone, and not so much as a lousy rat for the cooking pot. He nodded to the two sacrifice-looking men at his sides, who instantly surged forward, pinning my arms down to my sides. You're useless, Michael, and I have no use 
for useless people. You're going to the tribute, he whispered into my face. It was all I could do not to wince away from his fetid breath. And that pretty little woman of yours will be warming my bed before your bones are cold in the ground. When he got no reaction from this, he snarled, bringing his head crashing down into my upturned face. And for a little while, I knew no more. I awoke some time later, a gnarled hand pushing at my shoulder. Okay, okay, leave off, I croaked, sitting upright. I was in a cage with about six other people, two young girls and four other men, ranging from young to old. It was the old man still clawing at my shoulder as if he hadn't heard a word that I said. They're coming, he wheezed, coming for their tribute, coming for us. That's when I heard the roar of engines, deafening in the surrounding silence, as if the whole settlement was holding its collective breath. The sound of engines grew louder as a makeshift vehicle pulled into the settlement from the very direction I had just traveled. Great, I whispered, from the living dead to the motherfucking Thunderdome. More vehicles were arriving. Everything from open-top jeeps to large, canvas-covered trucks, blowing great plumes of smoke into the ash-filled air. From the lead vehicle, a leather-clad woman bounded forth, a makeshift spear clenched tight in her scarred, battered fist. She was a big woman, tall, raw-boned, with black mane-like hair flowing down her back. She smiled wickedly as the settlement's leader approached, revealing yellowed teeth filed down to sharp-looking points. At that smile, the approaching man faltered before continuing forward, bowing low. Ah, great lady, we're honored by your presence. The tribute awaits you, he said, his arms outstretched in a fawning gesture as he gently herded her towards myself and the rest of the terrified prisoners. A shabby-looking lot, she said, glancing over the cowering mass, all except myself, who met her glance with one of my own. Well, 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 she said, bending low to give me a closer look. What a pretty little man you are. You don't look diseased, anyway. I have never been overly fussy. That's what I like about men. You can do a lot more with a man than simply eat him. If her comment was supposed to strike fear in me, it didn't work. But I feigned it anyway, dropping my eyes and faking a raking shudder. She laughed at this and stalked away, the settlement's head man hot on her heels. I have an announcement to make, she bellowed. I found another settlement far to the east. This settlement is large and thriving and now belongs to me, and so I release you from your bondage. This place is dying. Hell, she said, glaring around. This place is already dead. You folks just don't have the good sense to lay still. Jonah, she commanded the headman who came forward. Tell me, what do you do with a chicken when it stops laying eggs? Before he could answer, she whipped a rust-covered machete from around her back and took his head with one foul swoop. For a moment, his body just stood there, spraying blood before it collapsed in a dusty heap at her booted feet. Round them up, she screamed at her men. There for the cooking pot, boys. The men let out a roar of excitement before giving chase to the fleeing crowd. It was over all too soon, as the denizens of the settlement were slaughtered in mass their bleeding torn bodies loaded onto the truck like sides of beef. What are these? A bald man with a scarred and battered face asked, rapping on the side of the cage. Constance turned to face him. Keep the man and the two girls. They can go to the breathing pens. The man is mine. Slaughter the rest. The man grunted and signaled the two men who came on the run. The cage was thrown open, and myself and the two crying girls were dragged out and shoved roughly towards the waiting trucks. From behind us came the screams of the dying as they were brutally dispatched. I didn't look back. Or even flinch. These people were not my problems. Only Constance and her imminent return to hell. We boarded the back of the truck and rode through the wasteland in the company of the dead. 
I was unsure just how long the journey lasted. I think at some point I may have simply drifted off. Either way, the sun was just starting to set in the west when the truck suddenly slowed, followed by a shouted command and the sound of a clinging gate. A voice was raised in greeting and the trucks lurched forward before coming to a complete halt. There are more raised voices and the echoes of coarse laughter before the back of the truck was flung open and we were herded outside. The Raider compound was very much like the settlement we had just left, only on a much larger scale. The only marked difference was a large, intact structure with a sheet metal roof. The faded picture of a pig wearing a chef's hat smiled obscenely from the building's flaking side. Not to worry, one man said, following my gaze. You're not for the grinder, my friend. <laughs> well, at least not yet. Constance wants to play with you a little first. Who knows? If you please her, you may yet live. Her last plaything lasted a whole week before she wore him out. Now take a seat, he said, shoving me down by the side of his truck. Constance will send for you when she's ready. And don't even think of running. Wouldn't dream of it. I smiled up at him. He must have seen something in that smile that he didn't like, and he scowled at me, before quickly turning away. I sat there for some time, the hellbound blade digging uncomfortably into the scant flesh of my thigh. The raiders hadn't bothered to search me, or anyone else for that matter, perhaps not seeing the ragged shelters as any kind of threat. That was fine by me. Like Lucifer said, this is all about the element of surprise. Sometime later, as darkness settled across the land, the same man from before dragged me to my feet. Come along, Prince Charming, he growled. Your new mistress is eager to see you. I let him lead me to the tent, set a little way back from the others before being rudely shoved inside. The tent was large and spacious, with glowing braziers and rug-covered floors, a table and chairs for eating. The rest of the room was dominated by a large double bed. Chains ending in bloody handcuffs hung down from the corners of the splintered bedposts. She followed my gaze and smiled wantonly. Take a seat, she said, gesturing towards the bed. I did as she bid, knowing that I would have to end this thing soon before she decided to slap on the cuffs. She was slinking towards me, shedding bits of clothing as she came on. Suddenly she moved lightning fast, pinning me beneath her. The blade strapped to my leg erupted into searing flames at her presence, setting my meager clothing on fire, causing her to leap back in pain and confusion. Not wasting any time, I tore the blade free and leapt from the bed, but she had already moved with that same eerie speed, putting the table between us. So, you're one of his, she snarled. Lucifer's bitch. But you don't know what a true bitch really is. Come, let me show you. The transformation was almost instantaneous. One minute, a naked woman stood before me. The next, a huge, slobbering hellhound. The last thing I saw before she leapt at me, clamping her massive jaws around my neck, was the glow of her burning crimson eyes. And suddenly, I was falling. I landed in Lucifer's great hall in a sprawling heap, only to be grabbed up like a ragdoll and smashed into the midnight blackened walls. How dared you fail me? The Dark Lord screeched, crushing my throat with a hand grown talon-like and twisted. I had seen him angry before, but nothing like this. His rage was suffocating, all-consuming. You're going back! He screamed at me from between razor-like teeth. You're going back, and you're going to break it for me. Do you understand? He said, shaking me back and forth, but I didn't understand. Break what? I managed to gasp through his crushing embrace. Something slid between his eyes, and he cast me away from him. Go back, he said, seeming to regain a little composure. Go back there, and kill that bitch. Give me what is mine. He clicked his fingers, and a fiery portal opened beneath me. Once again, I was falling. I awoke naked and suspended in midair, stifling a scream against the razor-sharp hooks embedded in my back. To my left and right hung similar corpses, strung up like sides of beef, some of them missing arms and legs, others gutted and cleaned out. I, myself, was mostly intact, and I 
surmised not much time had passed since Constant had bested me. A knife, I muttered. What the hell has she done with a knife? The corpse by my side suddenly turned its head and grinned at me. Who said you needed the knife in the first place? It croaked. Do you ever consider that it was merely a conduit for your own power? Is it? I asked, never even considering such a thing. No, fuckwit! The corpse grinned at me. You're fucking useless. Get the blade back and finish that bitch. Man, that is real funny, asshole. I growled. But I was only talking to a dead man. All life fled. All right, I said, raising my knees to my chest. Let's get this shit done with. With a cry, I thrust my legs down with all of my might. Again and again, feeling the hooks tear and slide through my flesh until at last, ah, I was free. I knelt on the cold stone floor, lost in agony until finally my wounds began to knit and heal. I stood then and made my way over to the door, which was mercifully unlocked before peering outside. It was full dark now, and only a few smoldering campfires remained, surrounded by snoring men, the sharp tang of homemade hooch, and roasting meat for fumier. Heading forward, I slinked into the night, keeping a wary eye out for any roaming guards, but there was nothing. These raiders consider themselves the apex predator of the wasteland. Why bother with guards? I mean, who in their right mind would dare to attack them? Sticking to the shadows, I made my way towards Constance's tent. There was a guard here. The man was asleep. Dead drunk like the rest of the motley crew. He was laying on his side, his arms wrapped around a makeshift spear, hugging it close like some deadly teddy bear. Squatting down on my haunches, I crept closer until I loomed above him, then gently, oh so gently, I slid his knife from its sheath. Clamping a hard hand over his mouth, I thrust the knife deep into the side of his neck. He kicked a little bit and bled a lot, but it was soon over. I sat there for some time, listening for the slightest noise or cry of alarm, but there was nothing. Only the sound of a stirring ash on the night wind. Standing, I took a firm grip on the bloody knife, and I slipped around the back of the tent. Only a single light bulb burned inside, and I prayed that Constance, believing me vanquished, had retired for the evening. The knife has to be inside, I considered. No way she could have touched it. Taking a deep breath, I sliced the canvas and slid inside. Constance was sat at her table, grinning at me. The hellbound blade sat atop the table between us. I noticed the rough bandage on her hand. I returned her smile with one of my own. Tried to wield it, did you? Guess you learned the hard way. It only serves one master. She ignored that. I knew you would return. Lucifer is nothing if not persistent. I shrugged, edging towards the table. He wants you back in hell where you belong. And where do you belong? She fired back at me. Do you think Lucifer will send you straight up to heaven when this is all over? Did you even consider why he doesn't collect these wayward souls of his himself? question caught me off guard. And that's when she made her move, leaping across the table at me, transforming into the giant hound as she came. But this time I was ready for her. Instead of leaping away, I leapt forward, diving under the table, popping up like a jack-in-the-box on the other side. I grabbed the hellbound blade just as she turned and launched herself at me once again. Swinging wildly, I slashed the side of her foaming muzzle. She leapt away, howling as her torn flesh began to smoke and char. I laughed at her as she began to backpedal out of the torn tent. Now, I said, weaving the burning blade at her, you are royally fucked. Her nerve broke and she turned and fled into the night. There was a sudden commotion, then another great howl of pain. I heard from the tent, dagger raised and just suddenly stopped before bursting into laughter. Constance's own men, woken by the commotion, had come on the run only to see a great feral beast covered in blood flee from their mistress's tent. Enraged, they fell upon her, stabbing and kicking, piercing her sides with makeshift spears and sharpened staves. Until at last, weakened and no longer able to hold on to her terrible transformation, she reverted back to her more human state. I will kill all of you for this, she spat at them. And I'll help her, 
I bluffed, raising the burning blade. That was enough for this rabble. Fearing their mistress' wrath and seeing a dead man come back to life, they fled screaming into the night. I stalked over to Constance, who was now trying to crawl away, leaving a bloody trail behind her. I stomped down on her back, driving her down into the dirt before grabbing a handful of her matted hair and placing the blade at her neck. Have you ever considered, I grated at her, that it's better to serve in hell than to reign in heaven? I didn't wait for her reply, but sliced her neck with precise ease, and once again, I was back in Lucifer's great hall. Well, well, well. Finally got the job done, did we, Mr. Davis? Real tough bitch, that one. He beamed down at me from his golden throne. In every way imaginable, I turned to face him, bowing low. Four down, one to go. <laughs> Tell me, are you by any chance a fan of Eastwood, or how about John Wayne? <laughs> he chuckled. I think I'm beginning to sense a theme, I sighed. Are you indeed? He laughed, slapping at his thigh before clicking his fingers and summoning another fiery portal. Well, he said with an evil glint in his eye. What are you waiting for? Hi-ho, Silver! Away! Turning from him, I headed for the portal, wanting nothing more than to put an end to this madness. Yeah. I said, giddy up, cowboy, and step through. I awoke in the desert, a figure looming above me. You picked one hell of a place to take a siesta, mister, the tall man said, straightening up and looking towards the horizon, one large hand stroking his handlebar mustache thoroughly. He was dressed head to foot in black, a large pistol hanging low on his hip. "'What's it to you?' I said, a little sourly, not happy at being once again in another desert. At least this one was blessedly free of radiation. Still, the sun burned my skin where it sat, white-hot fire in the hazy blue sky. The man turned back to me, pulling his long duster coat to one side, revealing a glittering golden star. The name's Erp, he said, looking me up and down. Wyatt Erp. I'm law around these parts. You want to watch your lip around me, boy? I ain't known for my patience. Why don't you tell old Wyatt why you're doing out here reeking of booze in the outskirts of town? What town? I blurted. Holy mother of Christ, he spat. You answer every question in one of your own. Tombstone, boy. Stop your delay and answer the question. You going into town drunk? His hands were now hovering over his pistols. My mind was racing, tripping over itself. Tombstone, Wyatt Earp. Jesus, I could hardly believe it. He was just about to make a grab for me when I blurted out the first lie that came to mind. Drunk. I... I got drunk as hell. Must have staggered out of town to take a piss, just keeled over, I said. Trying hard to play the simpleton. From town, he said, his hazy blue eyes narrowing. And just when did you hit town? See, I know just about every resident of the Tombstone. You ain't one of them. For once, I couldn't think of a single answer, but a gunshot suddenly rang out, and a woman screamed in pain. God damn it. He said, whirling towards the town. Those goddamn sons of bitch cowboys are in town again. And just like that, he hurried away. Stalking back towards Tombstone as if I no longer existed. Sagging with relief, I mopped at my brow, glad to be out of his presence. Impressive, isn't he? A voice growled from behind me. I whirled around, coming eye to eye with a huge mountain lion that had seemingly materialized out of nowhere and now sat on a nearby rock, its head cocked to one side as if wondering how good I would taste. He made it into heaven by the skin of his ass, Lucifer continued. What a prize he would have been, such a challenge to break. <laughs> oh well, he sighed. You can't always get what you want. 
sometimes what you need. I muttered. Ah, a Stones fan, are you, Mr. Davis? Personally, my favorite is Sympathy for the Devil. He chuckled obscenely. I wasn't really listening to him anymore, but I had fallen to my knees, frantically digging in the surrounding sand. What are you doing? He said, a hint of amusement in his voice. I'm looking for the knife, I shot back at him. What do you think I'm doing? Digging for grubs? He said, somewhat loftily. By the way, the thing that you are so desperately seeking isn't there. I stopped digging. Then where the hell is it? I want to get this over and done with. He looked back at me, and then his feral green eyes narrowed before lunging forward with blinding speed. I felt a terrible pain. I sat down hard, my chest bleeding. I cried out as I looked down at my flayed open chest, the gleam of bone shining wetly in the midday sun. But already the skin was beginning to knit and heal. Lucifer sat there silently watching me heal until finally I managed to crawl to my feet. The instant I stood, he gave me more of the same, only this time, shattering my ribcage, sending me flying into the sand in an explosion of blood and bone. I lay there for some time, feeling my body slowly begin to heal and reform. Finally, when I was whole again, I crawled to my knees and I sat there before him. My head bowed low. At last, he began to speak. I understand your need to wrap up this little adventure of ours, but always remember one thing, Mr. Davis. I am the master, and you are my dog. Don't you ever bark at me again. Now, get to your feet. I did as I was bid, keeping my eyes on my feet. Look at me, Christian. Look at me and tell me who you serve. You, my lord, I said and a kind of sadness came over me, as if I had somehow disappointed him and was in need of making amends. But I wasn't sure if this feeling came from me or was just another one of his sly tricks. And why is it you serve me so faithfully? There was something in his voice now, a kind of longing. Taking a deep breath, I did the only thing I could. I told the truth. Because I fear you, I stammered. I fear you more than anything I've ever known, more than the wrath of God Almighty himself. He grinned then. Well, for now, that is enough. You asked a question. Would you like an answer? Yes, Lord. Then ask again, and this time, mind your manners when you speak to me. The knife my lord. I said, bowing low. Where is the hellbound blade? Follow, he growled, leaping from the rock and heading deeper into the desert. We walked for hours, the sun giving way to shadows as we entered the shade of a small rocky outcrop. In there, he said, nodding towards a small cave-like entrance, surrounded by sagging timbers. What's in there? I got up the nerve to ask, but he ignored me loping inside. The place was pitch black and I stumbled, my shoulders brushing the rough hewn wall. Open your eyes, Mr. Davis. Really, open them. Remember the power I bequeathed you at Draven's Castle. Open your eyes and see. And just like that, the veil fell from my eyes and I could see clear as day in the deep darkness of this forgotten mind. Very good, Mr. Davis, very good indeed. You have such power. Now, more than ever, you must stop and learn to use it. With that hanging in the air between us, he hurried on ahead. A few minutes later, I came upon him, sat staring at a pile of massive boulders, broken timbers and dusty rubble, blocking the depths of the shattered mine. What now? I asked, standing beside him. He turned to me, his tongue lolling. The knife is behind that mess of boulders. If you still feel you need it, that is, then you must retrieve it for yourself. What? I exclaimed. And how the hell do you expect me to do that? And why is it buried there anyway? I said, pointing an accusing finger at the fallen boulders. Because I put it there. He grinned. Playtime's over, Mr. Davis. If you still feel you need that knife, then you must get it for yourself. What are you talking about? 
Of course, I need it. I mean, how else can I reap this final soul? How indeed, he said, staring at me blankly. I knew there would be no answers forthcoming, and so began to mooch around the edges of the fallen boulders, looking for a way inside. At my touch, a light burst into being, shining through a narrow hole from the other side. Wincing, I put my eye to the hole. The blade had burst into light in my presence, and lay amongst the debris and rubble just on the other side. At the sight of it, I felt a terrible longing and pounded at the hard rock in frustration. I see you found a way through, Lucifer chuckled. Some entrance, I turned on him. He shrugged. Do you remember Albert Foster? How could I forget? I grimaced. He had been the second soul I had captured, a corpse peddler. It had haunted the fog-strewn streets of Victorian London. What about him? I continued. Lucifer sighed. Do you remember how he escaped when you confronted him that second time? You mean after he set me on fire with flaming fists, I shuddered, still remembering the god-awful pain? Just so, Lucifer chuckled. You were quite the mess that particular day, when awful Albert had got through with you, but we aren't talking about that. We're talking about how he escaped you the second time. The cockroaches, I said, remembering Albert's terrible transformation. Just so, Lucifer said, slinking closer until I could feel his hot breath against my face. The cockroaches. But I can't do that, I stammered, looking at him incredulously. That was power given to him by Asmodeus, the one who orchestrated the breakout in the first place. Ah, uh, yeah, Asmodeus. We can talk of him another time, but tell me, Mr. Davis, do you believe Asmodeus's power is greater than mine? Or even your own? My own. Yes, your own, he snapped, his tail swishing angrily. Are you not my chosen? Haven't I promised you all the powers of hell? Must I now explain everything to that dull mind of yours when we are close to the end, or is it only fear and pain you understand and respect? If so, let me encourage you. If you don't transform and get through the wall... Then I'm going to rip your balls off, he snarled and showed razor-sharp teeth. I'm going to tear you open again and again until you either do as I bid, or you go insane with the pain of it all. But I, I don't know how, I cried out, backing away from him. He sighed then, some of the anger melting from him as he sat on his haunches. It's rather simple, Mr. Davis. Just bring your will to bear. Wish it to be so, and it will be. Want it like you wanted the deaths of so many of your victims. Tap into the primal desire of yours. That desire that you have so long tried to convince yourself is no longer there. That fury and bloodlust, the hatred. Let it loose. Become the creature you were always meant to be. I turned from him and glared down at the hole. He was right. He was always right. There was no longer any need to hide, no desire to change. I was already a lost soul, my days condemned to eternal torment. The worst that could happen had happened. I had been forsaken by both man and God, and there was literally nothing else to lose. Feeling that old hatred well up in me, building until I thought that I would burst with it, I directed my will, and I felt myself begin to change until I wasn't one but many. A scurrying mass with a thousand eyes that crawled up the wall and through the small opening, reforming back into human form on the other side. Howling in triumph, I scooped up the glowing blade. Lucifer answered my howl with one of his own, an ear-piercing shriek that brought me back to my senses. I had the blade, but I was... I was now trapped. If I took on my insect form again, I would no longer be able to carry the knife. Suddenly, I was furious that mere stone would dare to stand against me. Bringing my will to bear, I slammed my fist into the rock, causing the whole mass to explode outward in a shower of dust and rubble. Lucifer just managed to leap out of the way, and there came a low rumbling from deep in the ground. Run, Mr. Davis. 
If you don't want to spend an eternity buried alive, run! I did as he said, both of us sprinting for the exit. We managed to jump free just as the whole mess came shattering down in an explosion of choking dust and flying pebbles. Subtle, Christian, he glared at me, shaking dust from his coat. Very subtle indeed. Sorry, I said, somewhat sheepishly, feeling suddenly exhausted where I sat, covered in dust and filth. Lucifer patted over and licked my face with a long, wet tongue. Don't worry. It takes some getting used to. You'll find it exhausting at first, but your batteries will recharge. In fact, now that the process has started, you'll only get stronger. But why? Why... Why have you given me these gifts now when we're so close to the end? Who says it's the end? This is only the beginning. There's so much you don't know, so much I need to tell you, but there's no time now. So we must finish what we started. The final soul, you mean? Yes. The man you're looking for is just east of here in a cliffside encampment. He and his bunch of bandits have taken over a small town. It's from there that they strike terror and discord throughout the land. The man you seek is Harvey Dillon, a murderer, rustler of cattle. In life, he was heavily into torture. The things he did to the flesh of victims could rival the horrors of hell. And now he's back and so much worse than before. Not that I give a fig for his victims, but he belongs to me. He belongs in hell. And that's what you're going to do, Mr. Davis. You're going to bring him back to us, aren't you? I stood up and brushed away the last of my humanity. You're goddamn right I am. We walked through the night, Lucifer padding along beside me. He seemed stronger now, like he could stay in this world longer than before, even if it was only trapped in the body of a lower base creature. The first rays of dawn were just starting to stain the night sky when he heard the sound of a rider coming on hard behind us. Suddenly, Lucifer grabbed up my sleeve and dragged me down into the underbrush. The hell are you doing? Be silent, he hissed. Don't move. Don't make a fucking sound. Moments later, a horse galloped into view, frothing at the mouth as the rider pulled hard at the reins, bringing the big mare to a halt. A pair of dusty boots hit the ground. From our position, I could just make out the man's lower half. He wore a long, dust-smeared overcoat. A shiny revolver hung low on his hip. And in one scarred and battered hand, he held a torn-looking Bible that seemed to be missing many pages. The man's feet turned as if he were scanning his surroundings. And my body broke into a cold sweat, fear worming its way into my guts. Therefore, the man intoned, as the tongue of fire burns the dried grass, you shall go down in flames for your roots. They are rotten, and your blossoms shall be nothing more than dust on the wind. For you have forsaken the Lord thy God and rejected his laws. Henceforth I shall stretch out his hand against you. I'll find you, he muttered. I'll find you and I'll send you back to hell from whence you came. That said, he mounted his horse and rode away. I let out a breath I didn't even realize I'd been holding, and I sagged down the tension, leaving my body. Who is that? I said, turning to Lucifer. Trouble, he replied, glaring at the receding figure. A preacher driven mad by the light of God. A joker in the pack, the eye in the middle of a storm. God's feeble attempt to divert the course of prophecy. Many times I've tried to rid myself of the thorn in my side. Once when his wife's cold dead fingers closed around his throat, I thought I had him. But his love for God was greater, and it prevailed. Let me kill him for you, my lord. No, he snapped at me. You must leave him alone. Go nowhere near him, not unless he forces a confrontation. I must leave you now. He suddenly blurted. This body can no longer hold my magnificence. Just, just over the horizon is the town. Go there. They know of the man you seek. For now, farewell. 
And just like that, it was gone, leaving the corpse of a mountain lion behind, which immediately began to rot and smoke. I walked on, the sun beating down on me like an anvil, until at last I crested the cactus-strewn hill and looked down at the town below. It looked more like every town ever seen in the Spaghetti Western. All bleached timbers, false storefronts, horseshit-strewn streets. Slowly I made my way down to the outskirts of town, not really sure where I was going or who I was supposed to be talking to. But this was far from the first time Lucifer had left me with my dick swinging in the wind. I just have to make the best of things. Besides, with my newfound powers, I was feeling more confident than ever before. As I walked more fully into town, people seemed to be giving me sideways glances and quickly scurrying away. What the hell, I murmured, just before I felt a sudden blow to the back of my head. It all went dark. I awoke in a darkened cell. There was blood on my hair, but of course no wound. Quickly I felt around and found the hellbound blade still stuffed down the back of my jeans. There came a sudden rattling of keys and a squeaking of a door. The corridor was lit by a flickering oil lamp. A man stood outside my cell. He was willow-thin, with a shock of red hair, and wiry-looking side chops. A silver star glittering on his narrow chest. You got some nerve showing your face back in this town, Andy Wayne, after what you did to that whore over in Ed's place. Then burned down the church and all. There's a whole mess of people right now over at Ed's drinking it up, and planning a hanging party. And you know what, Andy? I was pretty fond of Jessie before you messed up her face. Guess you can call me a regular. He grinned, a gap-toothed smile. So I reckon I'm just gonna let them hang you, partner. Now how do you feel about that? Well, I said, stumbling along the bars and feigning exhaustion. I think you're a pock-faced son of a whore and the best part of you ran down the crack of your mama's ass, I said. I spat in his face and began to laugh hysterically. His face went first red, then purple as he fumbled his keys in the lock, revolver in hand. Boy, I'll beat you black and blue when we was kids, and I want to beat you down again. There won't be much left of you for that hanging party. You better believe that. Thrusting open the door, he charged in, smashing the gun barrel across my face. I grinned at him through smashed teeth and a torn mouth, grabbing his hand and smashing it against my knee, sending his revolver flying. His wrist snapped like a rotten twig. He bellowed in pain, but I caught him up by the throat. I pulled the knife from around my back. I plunged it into his shoulder before twisting it cruelly, dragging it out and thrusting it into his thigh. Screaming, he sagged and fell to the floor, grasping at his bleeding leg and rocking to and fro. I kicked him over and over again, before kneeling down beside him, my knife at his neck. I'm looking for the Dylan gang. I growled, pressing the blade hard against his bobbing Adam's apple. You wouldn't know where said banditos would happen to be, would you? The light of hope gleamed in his eyes. Sh sure, sure, he gasped. They're camped up at High Canyon Ridge. They took over Heston's ranch. Hell, they took over the entire village. Where is it? This High Canyon Ridge. Two days east of here. Just follow the river out of town. You can't miss it. Please, Andy, d don't kill me, okay? Sorry. Andy ain't home, I grinned, dragging the knife across his throat. His hot blood spurted over me. Quickly, I stood up and headed outside. There I was greeted by the townsfolk, flaming torches held aloft. It seemed like there was a gun or a rope dangling from every hand. I looked down at my bloody clothes and grinned at him. Just give me a second to explain. There was a cry of outrage and bullets began to fly, sending me crashing backwards as I was peppered with hot lead, my shirt and chest exploding in a welter of blood. The last shot rang out, and there was silence. Until I stood back up. That's when the women began to scream and the men began to curse. Quickly reloading, some of them took to their heels. You wanna play? I grinned down at them through bloody teeth. Okay, I can do that. Let's play. Bringing my will to bear, I summoned the hellfire to my hand and released it amongst them. The flames jumped from one person to the next, lighting them up, their skin melting, running like hot wax as they thrashed and screamed. 
and when it was all over, I walked amongst them, their ashes stirring on the ground in the cold night wind as I followed the river out of town. The morning found me by the riverside, washing ashes and blood from my clothes. There was a splash, and a nearby beaver pulled itself out of its free-flowing waters. Lucifer? Is that you? Who else? The beaver chuckled. Just before its head blew apart into about three hundred pieces, spattering my face with blood and gore. I spun around, there was a cowboy rushing down the hill towards me, his one good blue eye blazing with pure hate. I got you now, you son of a bitch! He fired off another round, but stumbled just as he pulled the trigger. The shot went wild, but the bullet, which I was pretty sure was meant for my head, buried in my shoulder. The pain was enormous, like, like nothing I'd ever felt before. It spun me around, dumping me into the freezing river, the current pulling me away. The cowboy stood on the riverbanks, barking off round after round. Another bullet clipped my ear, and I ducked under the flowing water. Whoever he was, the son of a bitch was deadly accurate. You can't hide from me, boy, the mad preacher screamed as I rounded the bend. You can't run from Jacob Masterson. God's gonna cut you down. You hear me, you son of a bitch? God's gonna cut you down. I stayed in the river for some time, letting the hard current drag me miles between us before finally managed to climb out into the opposite side of the riverbank. There I collapsed, and I checked my wounds. They hadn't closed, but burned like acid, small wisps of smoke rising from the wound in my shoulder. A crow landed on my outstretched boot and hopped up my leg as it drew close to my face. I could hear it muttering to itself. Bible-thumping, Jesus-loving son of a bitch, it cursed. Of all the goddamn nerve. Lucifer, I gasped. Is that you? Ask me that just one more fucking time, he caught in my face, and I swear by the bloodiest depths of hell I will peck out your eyes. Kate, Kate, I threw up my hands in surrender, wincing at the pain in my shoulder. Why isn't it healing? I said, flopping back down. Because that crazy asshole shot you with silver. Blessed silver, actually. We need to get this out of you before the poison spreads to your body and it starts to shut down. Okay, now hold still. Suddenly, his head darted down and he buried his sharp beak into the raw wound. I screamed in agony as he rooted around. After what felt like an eternity of pain, he pulled free the smoking silver slug and spat it onto the ground. Immediately, the wound began to close and the pain began to first fade, then eventually vanished altogether. I was instantly on my feet, suddenly ferocious. I'm going to kill that mad motherfucker, I growled. I'm going to cut him into little pieces and piss on his bones. No, you're not. I told you to stay away from him. Like I have a choice, I cut him off. He's tracking me somehow. He He's fucking tracking me. Perhaps, he replied. But Masterson is not the target you're here for. Dylan, he must die now today time grows short but it has to be today why i asked why today stop your infernal questions he snapped at me just get on with your job i will run interference on masterson once the job is done he will become irrelevant to the whole thing what thing i asked him knowing he was keeping something from me but i didn't quite have the nerve there's a bridge about a mile down the river he said, lighting up upon a nearby branch. Cross the bridge. Follow the winding path out of the canyon. The place you seek sits upon a nearby ridge. That said, he took to the sky. Soon he was nothing more than a black dot on the horizon. <sighs> Sighing, I clambered to my feet, brushing myself down and quickly hurried away, keeping my ears open for the sound of the pounding hooves. Whoever that Masterson character was, he had Lucifer unnerved, and I wanted no more part of him. Best to just finish up here and get back to the safety of hell. Less than an hour later, I came upon the ridge, which was nothing more than a few splintered planks held together with frayed ropes, the river flowing fast beneath. Taking a deep breath, I sprinted across, 
wincing at every creak and crack until finally I was across. The rocky sides of the canyon rose up before me. There was an arrow path leading straight through the canyon's sheer sides and another small track that wound its way up a flat-looking ridge. I could just make out the sides of a small building and the muted sounds of human voices. Okay, I mumbled. Up we go. The track itself was narrow, perhaps wide enough to accommodate a single horse, not much more. I was about halfway up when I noticed the vultures circling overhead and the faint smell of smoke that blew on the light breeze. Shit, I cursed, drawing the knife and coming on the run. By the time I hit the top, I was breathing heavily and drenched with sweat. Just like Lucifer had said, there was a village here atop this flat plateau, or at least, at least there had been. Now there was nothing more than a smoldering ruin, bodies of men, women, children, and even a few horses lay scattered about, their poor broken bodies smoking in the midday sun. Welcome to hell, partner, a voice rang out. A wild-eyed man stepped from one of the charred and blackened ruins. He was shirtless, his jeans torn and bloody. In one shaking hand, he held a revolver leveled at my chest. In the other, a half-empty bottle of whiskey. The hell happened here? I asked, lowering the knife. He laughed then, the light of madness dancing on his bloodshot eyes. Harvey's what happened here, he spat. Killed everyone, the whole village, his crew. I seen things, he said, tears rolling down his face. Things no man should ever see. Harvey, he had powers. He burned everyone. And that laughter, he mumbled. That god-awful laughter. He shook his head, as if trying to rid himself of the memory of it before raising the bottle and gulping down the fiery liquid. At last, the bottle was empty, and he cast it away from him. I hear it, mister. Even when I sleep, even drunk. He chuckled obscenely. I can hear it right now. Suddenly, he put the revolver to his head. No! I screamed, lunging at him. But he had already pulled the trigger, the sound of the shot booming around the canyon's walls. Son of a bitch! I screamed, kicking his flopping corpse more out of frustration than any real anger. Whatever had happened here, I had missed it. And Harvey Dillon had moved on, leaving his crew behind or it was left of them anyway. Putting the knife away, I stomped across to the only remaining intact building, the one I had observed from the bottom of the trail. I went through the open door, but recoiled in horror as a swarm of flies fled before me. There were bodies here, three of them, hanging from the ceiling. It was impossible to make out the sex, they were too torn up for that. They had been skinned and butchered, bone and flesh gleaming wetly, and even I cursed, hoping like hell they'd been dead before this terrible torture had taken place. Quickly I left, slamming the door behind me. What now? I mumbled to myself. Where the hell did you go? How the hell am I supposed to find you? Lucifer's words came back to me. It has to be now. Today. Worried, I looked at the midday sun. God only knew what he would do to me if I failed him. Sitting down in the blowing sand, I once again remembered Lucifer's words. Will it, and it will be. Concentrating, I cast my will into the wind, feeling my awareness searching for Dylan's rotting soul. And there it was. Just west of here. A dark figure in the desert sat by a blazing campfire, gleaming eye hooded beneath a wide-brimmed hat. I have you now, asshole, I growled, leaping to my feet. Even now I could feel him like a magnet pulling me like a iron filling toward him. Strolling over to one of the dead horses, I laid a hand upon its smoking flesh. Rise, I commanded. Rise and serve me. At first... Nothing happened. Gritting my teeth and bringing all of my hate and rage to bear, I thrust it forward into the dead creature that began to shudder and twist. At last, its deflated eyes began to fill until they rolled white and the dead thing stumbled to its feet. Not wasting any time, I grabbed at its tattered mane and jumped on its back. 
Digging my feet into the black and skeletal sides, immediately the creature began to gallop. Guided by my will, we raced down the canyon side, the stench of burned flesh and blood covering me like a comforting haze. Night was coming on fast when I spotted his flickering campfire in the near distance. Climbing from my mount, I clicked my fingers, turning it to dust in the wind. I sat down, crossed my legs, and called out to Lucifer, wanting to know more about my quarry before the final confrontation. Suddenly there was a sharp bite on the back of my hand. Cursing, I looked down and saw a huge, hairy tarantula. Poisonous as ever, I see. But the spider did not answer, but merely started to crawl away. Still, the message was clear. Get on with the job. Sighing, I got to my feet and squashed the little bastard, just out of pure spite, before continuing onwards. Not even bothering with stealth, now comfortable with my newfound powers, I approached the dying campfire and the man hunkered down by its flickering light. So you finally came for me, the man chuckled. The devil's- Yeah, I interrupted. The devil's bitch. Lapdog is Satan. I've heard it all before, my friend. You're such a fool, he laughed, casually climbing to his feet. Didn't you ever wonder what's really going on here? I know exactly what's going on, I smirked at him. I know all about it, the rebellion of hell, Asmodeus, setting you free to undermine my master. He laughed then, and slapped his knee. <laughs> rebellion in hell. Like they would ever dare to go against your master, he said mockingly. Well, you're here, aren't you? I said, not falling for his ruse. You escaped. Now I'm here to send you back. Escaped, he said, shaking his head sadly. Not escaped set free. Nothing happens in hell without Lucifer say so. But, but why? I stammered. Why would he set you free? You and the other four? That's the question. He grinned at me, but there was a great sadness in his eyes. For pawns, my friend. Pawns on the great chessboard of eternity, so. Let's play. And I believe he grinned slyly. It's my move. Suddenly he raised his hands and a great maelstrom began to blow, whipping up in the sand. Quickly I threw up my hand to protect my face. Even through the biting sand I could see him twist and turn as he went through some terrible transformation. Other figures rising up from the endless sands. And just like that, the wind dropped. And a herd of crimson-eyed horses suddenly stood before me. With a great snorting and thundering of hooves, they raced towards me, meaning to trample me to dust. A shot rang out, and the lead horse went down, exploding into hardened sand. Another shot rang out, another one, and another of the demons went down. Something hit me high in the chest, throwing me to one side. Blood and bone exploded. I landed hard on my back, unable to breathe. It was that mad preacher, the one Lucifer had called Jacob riding like the wind towards the demon herd. The reins of his big mare clamped between his teeth, a pistol in each hand, laying the very wrath of God upon the now terrified horses who had turned to flee. Clamoring to my feet, feeling the terrible silver spread through my body, I saw him fire a last shot, hitting the transformed Harvey in the side of the neck. Instantly, the rest of the herd turned to dust, and Harvey... Harvey lay in the dirt, bleeding hard, gravely injured, but still very much alive. Masterson took no notice of him, but whirled his big mount around, coming straight for me. Come on then, you son of a bitch, I growled, raising the now burning blade. Grinning, Masterson fired off another shot, and the blade in my hand exploded. It was as if I heard every soul in hell cry out at its destruction. Sighting down the barrel of his gun, Masterson pulled the trigger. Intent on my destruction, but his eyes widened in shock as his gun clicked empty. With a cry of triumph, I swung what was left of the shattered blade at him, burying it in the back of the mare's chest. The horse screamed and went down with an explosion of blood and sand, trapping its rider beneath. Quickly I staggered over, blood pouring from the terrible wound in my chest, but the preacher had already managed to kick himself free. Even as badly injured as he was, his fingers were already doing their deadly dance as he quickly reloaded his smoking revolvers. With a cry, I charged at him, but he grinned, raising the revolvers, and I knew I was dead. But suddenly he howled in pain and began to dance around, firing his guns into the dirt that was now somehow crawling with large black snakes that hissed and struck at him. Still, he shot them, 
blowing them into tiny pieces, and when his guns clicked empty, he stomped them into the dirt, growling and spitting curses, but even his terrible vitality could not last, and he went down under the onslaught of the deadly venom. The snakes all around him began to squirm and meld into a giant serpent with glowing red eyes looming above him. Ah, masters, it hissed. I have you at last. What a thorn in my side you've been. Unbelievably, the old preacher laughed. The serpent suits you, Lucifer. A low creature that crawls with its face in the dirt. Shunned by all men. Lucifer hissed venom, dripping from his needle-like fangs, smoking where it hit the parked earth. Fearless as ever, masters. But it's you who now lies in the dirt. You're a dying old man, but you could live yet. Join me. Bow before me. Call me master and king of kings, and I will spare your life. Again that harsh laugh. I'd rather fuck a cornhole filled with chili flakes than serve a poor, broken-down asshole such as yourself. You're nothing to me but a low-down, mangy dog. Oh, get to killing me. You're tired of your yammering. Lucifer howled his outrage and frustration. Christian, he commanded, slithering away. Kill this fool. I'll not soil myself with his death. Staggering over. My knees weakened. I collapsed on top of him, straddling his broken body. His hand came up, weakly grabbing for my throat. His eyes filled with hate, blood on his lips, but I knocked his clawing hand aside and pinned them beneath my knees. Who are you? I screamed into his face. Who the hell are you, Masterson? But he didn't answer me. Only looked up to the heavens as if listening intently and smiled. The sons of my son. That'll be the end of you, he growled at me. Now get to killing me if that's what you're gonna do. I bought my ticket to heaven long ago. And I'm afraid of dying, then. Besides, I'm already tired of looking at your asshole face. That said, he spat a wad of bloody phlegm right into my face. With a howl of rage, I pulled what was left of the hellbound blade from the dead horse and raised it above my head for the killing strike. But the light had already faded from those hazel blue eyes. He lay there, dead. A small smile frozen on his lips, his eyes turned up towards heaven. Yeah, you had balls, my friend. I said, wiping his blood from my face. I'll give you that. And you had balls. A groan came just off to my right. It was Harvey Dillon pulling himself through the sand like a broken snake, leaving a trail of sticky blood behind him. Standing, I weaved over to him and knocked him onto his back before straddling his twisted form. I brought what was left of the hellbound blade down, piercing the diseased heart beneath, then sending his loathsome soul straight back to hell. But suddenly, time slowed, and then stopped, before the final blow could land. Please, don't, a voice said to my right. I slowly turned my head, the rest of my body frozen in time. There was an angel, kneeling before me. Its great white wings spread across its back, their tips brushing against the sand. Please don't, Mr. Davis. All of creation depends upon the final move. Who are you? I asked, shocked by its beauty and splendor. I'm Gabriel, it said, its beautiful blue eyes boring into mine. I am the messenger of God. Impressive, isn't he? Lucifer laughed, where he had appeared just off to my left. But this time he wasn't in the body of some loathsome beast animal, but in his own beautiful, terrible form. His black wings folded about him as if seeking comfort. I looked from one to the other. In many ways they were the same, but in others terrifyingly different. The angel looked to be full of light and love. Lucifer, on the other hand, was filled with a swirling darkness, and yet he was still more beautiful than the glowing angel, as if his darkness didn't diminish him, but somehow added to his allure. 
Brother, the angel said, acknowledging Lucifer, who gave the slightest of nods in return. Say what you have to say, Gabriel, your presence offends me. The angel ignored that and turned to face him once again. He's been lying to you, my son for he was ever the great liar. He has been using you all this time. From the moment you were born, he's corrupted you, bent you to his will. What are you talking about? I gasped, unable to comprehend. He's put his mark on you the moment you were born, Gabriel continued gently. He marked you as one of his own. It was he who turned you into a mad killer. All those nights in that orphanage, Slithering from the shadows, laying under your crib, whispering an endless deluge of obscenities into your poor, innocent mind. Don't you understand? It was him who drove you mad, set you on the path to mayhem, murder. He cemented your free will. But why? I gasped. Why me? What does he want from me? The angel smiled sadly and gently stroked my brow. He wants you to free him, to break the very seals of hell and bring his kingdom to earth. It, wh what seals? I said, yelling at him with anger and frustration. I, I haven't broken any seals. Oh, but you have, my son. Four so far, and you're on your way to the final one. Then he'll be set free. I looked down at the dying man before me, my knife above his heart. Seals. Seals, you mean him. He's just an escapee, they all were. I sent them back, I didn't have any choice. The angel sighed. Yes, they are escapees. But so much more. You see, in the beginning, when Lucifer was cast down and imprisoned, five great seals inscribed with the very word of God were put in place to hold him, confine him. He could not touch them unless he suffered the true death. And he'd be returned back to the universe. But his will is not so easily cemented. If he could not touch them, then he would change them. And so, over the long millennia, he bent his terrible will towards them until at last they become incorporeal. Much to his frustration, he still could not leave. But perhaps they could. And so he found five of the most evil souls in hell and placed them inside, using all of his will and with the seal somewhat weakened. He made the smallest of cracks between this world and the hell of his own making and set them free. But the seals were never made of this world, and grew even weaker. Yet Lucifer could not lay his hands upon them, or he wasn't willing to try for fear of the true death. And so he groomed you to do it for him. From the moment of your conception, he used you. He put the knife in your hand on earth, put another in your hand in hell, an instrument not forged in hellfire, but forged in heaven. Just as my brother Michael, his sword, so Lucifer had his knife. My brother still bears the scars of its terrible wrath. I looked toward Lucifer, his face impassive. Is that true, you son of a bitch? Is, is it all true? Every word of it, he smiled. I answered that smile with one of my own. I won't do it. I won't set you free. Not now, not ever. You can rot in hell for all eternity. If that's your decision, I respect it. He nodded thoughtfully. But, before you decide, I mean really decide, just ask him one question, he said, nodding towards the glowing angel. That's all I ask. Just one tiny question. What question? I spat at him. Ask him if you will go to heaven. I mean, if you stay your hand, you will have defeated God's most hated enemy. You will have saved billions of men, women, innocent children from annihilation. Go ahead, Mr. Davis. Ask him. Will I? 
I said, turning back to Gabriel. If I do this, if I save the world, if I trap Lucifer, will I finally be at peace? Will I see, will I see the face of God? Can I... Can I be forgiven? The angel smiled sadly. There can be no redemption for one such as you, my son. Your action condemned you to hell when you murdered all of those innocent people. But... But you said he made me do it. He stole my free will. He used me, I roared. You said it yourself. You, he made me do it. They don't care, Lucifer said, falling upon his knees before me and grabbing up my face, my nose almost touching his. Don't you understand? They don't fucking care. Ask yourself, my son. Couldn't they have stopped it? Is God not all-powerful? All those nights I whispered into your lonely crib from the depths of my own forsaken hell. Could God not have silenced my voice the first time you slit an innocent throat? Could God not have stayed your hand? Yes. Yes, he could, but he didn't. He didn't care enough about you to stop it. Not only. See, only now. Only now, when it matters, do they bother to even acknowledge your existence and try to manipulate you? And what do they offer in return? Nothing. Only an eternity trapped in hell. They simply don't care. Why should you serve them? For the glory of God, huh? He barked a harsh laugh. Is that their reason? He's at their best offer. I'm offering you a place by my side. Together, we'll take this world, we'll shape it into our own image. You are my son, Christian. I placed my hand over your heart the moment it let out its first beat. I looked at him. I knew for the first time, perhaps in an eternity of existence, He was speaking the truth. I turned to the waiting angel. Tell your God. I said, bite me. No! The angel screamed as I fought off its spell and brought what was left of the hellbound blade whistling down, breaking the final seal. We were standing atop a great hill. Below us, a huge battle raged between angels and demons. In the midst of this fury was a man with a silver sword who raged amongst demon kind, slaughtering all before him. Who's he? I asked Lucifer, who stood beside me watching the battle intently. Masterson, Lucifer growled. Another God-cursed Masterson. Wild card. The eye in the center of a storm. But not to worry, he smiled. He can change nothing. So, what shall we do next? He grinned as the chaos continued below us. I closed my eyes, smelling the ashes, a small smile playing across my lips. Now we set it to burn. Now we burn them all. His hand fell upon my shoulder. It felt good there, like the embrace of an old friend, like a lover's kiss. But best of all, it felt like coming home. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. Quick reminder, I am also a narrator over at Chilling. If you guys like the stories that you're listening to here, then I'm sure you'll like the stories that you can listen to over at Chilling, because they're almost the same thing, I'm still narrating them, but you can select your own background music or background sounds, and you could select a whole mess of other narrators, such as Autumn Ivy, 
Swamp Dweller, and a bunch of my other friends. If you guys are interested in checking out Chilling App, starting up with a free trial, you can use the link in the description down below, or you can head over to thechillingapp.com and also use those free trials to win prizes from their giveaways. And as always, I would love to give a big thank you to everyone who's supporting me over on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, you guys keep things going, especially while things have been nuts for me over the past couple of months, and things have been getting crazier and crazier as time goes on. You guys are the ones who are keeping me sane, and I mean that with all sincerity, that you guys have helped me immensely. So, in my personal life and my professional life, I want to give a very big thank you to... Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, Lakeda Canizales, Mr. B. Foster Pepper Squeezer, Travis, Joseph Calarudo, Who Would It Be, Dante Kincaid, Fox Hound 803, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Priorch, Bastion Beefcake, Jeff the Killer's Cultist, Love You M&M, M, Insanity Gamer X, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Emma Cork, Jay Kearns, Himbo Jerry, Sam Ahai, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Captain Scurvy, Escadine, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Our Min Sec Time, Angelus, Seclude, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier and Cheyenne, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tri Magazine, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Michael Limchok, Jerk Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Shelly J, Fakamel, The Legal Account, Melted Lake, Polly Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Theater Chip, Acid System, Mom. Kiri the Sloth, Buster's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, and Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. To everyone on this list, everyone in the description, and of course anyone who could support even just one dollar, thank you all so much for making my life significantly easier with this. And if you guys would like to be able to join any of the names that you see here, or down there, or anything at all, head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And with that, I wish you all a very, very pleasant night, and sweet dreams.